Hello everyone, uh, thanks for joining me. I've got a a fun show today. As as you'll all know, I've kind of been networking around and talking to people who have who have been uh, swimming in the millennial kingdom theory, like myself. Uh, people who've been doing this a lot longer than I have, of course. And in the hopes that I could maybe learn a thing or two about different perspectives on this angle that maybe I've not considered. And uh, yeah, today I've managed to get somebody who um, people have been asking me to talk to for a long time. And I have actually been a long time listener of this uh, gentleman myself. And I have Noel Hadley of the Unexpected Cosmology with me here today. And he's going to, uh, yeah, he's going to help clear a few things up for us, I think, with this wealth of knowledge. And I know I'm not going to go too deep into it myself, what this man's all about. I'm going to let him tell you for himself. So, uh, Noel, how are we? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on, Paul. I know that I think it was probably last October or the whereabouts where we first contacted each other and talked about uh, doing this together. And it's like October, November, and it just kept not working out. So it's good to finally be on. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, no, thanks for finally taking the time to do this. Yeah, it's just uh, the problem is with time differences, isn't it? Because uh, America, US, family you know, having kids, all the rest of it, you know, life gets in the way, but we, we did it. We managed to, we, we persevered. So I'm, I'm thankful that you managed to do this. No, I really am. Yeah. I've, uh, I've basically locked down the upper portion of my house. At least I, you know, I, I'm not out there to police the hallway, but I've told everyone to keep to the first floor for this, uh, for this discussion. So hopefully I will not have any, uh, outbreak of children in the room. You know how that goes. I do. I'm currently sat in the car outside of my house to make sure that doesn't happen here as well. So uh, you, you you have to do what you have to do, don't you? <laughs> it's one of those. But, no, but thank you very much, uh, Noel. So really what I'd like you to, to do just to open this up is ex for people who don't know who you are, do you want to just give a bit of a backstory about what you're all about, uh, where they can find you, maybe your publishing company as well? And then we'll get straight into the uh, the Millennial Rain topic. So I'll let you give a brief introduction there. Absolutely. Yeah. So my name is Noel Joshua Hadley. I'm a, my YouTube channel is the unexpected cosmology and the unexpected cosmology. It's more than just, you know, a YouTube channel. It's, it's a, a book publishing provider and we put out new books, new magazines every single month, many of which are mine, some are guest writers. And we put a big emphasis on ancient books, scripture, uh, heart, you know, uh, rarely read, you know, books from the 1800s, things like that. And, but first and foremost, the unexpected cosmology is a ministry. And I put a heavy emphasis on uh, sh shepherding and leading people spiritually closer into relationship with Yahuwah or see Yahusha HaMashiach. And the theme verse of, of the unexpected cosmology is Revelation 14, 12 of all passages. There's actually three times in the book of revelation where it talks about the people that satan or the dragon is specifically at war with and those are the kodashim or the set apart and it describes them on three occasions and revelation 14 12 says that those who endure until the end the set apart are those who keep the father's commands and the testimony of yahusha hamashiach and so that the the emphasis of my ministry is is showing that uh, you can't separate the Father's commands from a testimony of Yahushua HaMashiach because Yahushua, Messiah, he personally testified to the Father's commands and they're they're inseparable. And I really want to give people permission. I mean, my, 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 entire, my heart's desire is to give people permission to go into a deeper relationship with the Father, uh, with our Father in heaven, and to be more, you know, be obedient to him and to follow his command. So, uh, but that being said, I'm, I grew up as a, as a PK for anyone who doesn't know what that acronym in, acronym means. It's a pastor's kid. I grew up in a parsonage. Uh, church was my life. You know, when the doors open or close, I was there. And so, yeah, um, my, I think that my big waking up moment though was back in 2015 and that's when the flat earth took off and when i was overjoyed i was overjoyed to learn about uh hebrew cosmology or some people call it biblical cosmology and how much more literal how truly literal the bible is and in fact all throughout my life i've stated time and again that i'm constantly wrong about the bible and that i'm constantly changing my position uh but it's always been to take it more literally 
every single time. It, it's to take a more literal position. And so mm. um, when the flat earth came along, that just opened up this uh, Pandora's box. That's almost a bad terminology because, you know, Pandora's box is referenced to like evil spirits coming out. But it, it just opened up this uh, the, these floodgates of understanding in the scripture. And I started seeing all these other things in there like um like soul sleep for example you know i was never taught that growing up or um you know one of my favorite is um is psalms one and psalms one says uh blessed is the blessed is the man who delights in the torah of yahuwah and on that torah he meditates day and night and i was thinking about that i'm like wow you know it, david is saying a man who ponders and, and reflects on the Torah day and night will be blessed, right? And I want to be blessed. And, you know, the thing is, is like, you know, today in any kind of, in any church or congregation, David and the prophets would be thrown out to the curb as, uh, as heretics uh, for proclaiming this. But uh, I digress. And the other one, of course, was uh, the Millennial Kingdom, which we're going to be talking about today. That was another big one for me. And I would say it was several years ago, as I'm reading the Bible, I'm starting to get the sense that uh, there was the New Testament was based around a mirror event that happened in the wilderness when they when the Israelites left their slavery in Egypt and they went to Mount Sinai and then they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. And I, it, it, the promise at the end of the 40 years, of course, is that they would go into the 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 land itself. And I was seeing the same thing happening with Yahushua Hamashiach showing up in this generation and all the language in Scripture was. Uh, it, it was it was focused on this idea that you know he was coming back quickly within that generation, right? And that all these fulfillments would happen. And and I mean, even Paul in his terminology, he says, "We who remain will be caught up," right? And I'm like, "Well, is that a true or false prophecy, Paul? Because you're 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 implying that you're going to be a part of this, you know, that generation." Mm -hmm. And so you have this, I, I started seeing this false hope in there because I'm like, well, if he didn't, if he didn't come when he said he was going to come, then that's, you know, that's a, that's a false hope. And in fact, it was C.S. Lewis who said that the most embarrassing thing about the Bible, uh, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing C.S. Lewis, but he said the most embarrassing thing about Jesus is that he said uh, he he spoke this prophecy that didn't come true, that he was going to return for that generation. And I remember when I read that, I'm like, wait, what? Well, what I didn't really know what to do with all this information, this is back with like the Revelation 12 sign and 2017 and all these people are saying we're entering the tribulation and blah, blah, blah. And, and I didn't really know what to do with all this information because I'm like, okay, it looks like the Bible was fulfilled back in 70 AD. That makes a lot of sense to me. But what doesn't make sense to me is I look through history and I'm like, well, where did the millennial kingdom happen? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I could never get on board with the preterists who are saying it was just a, it was a spiritual uh, kind of a, you know, syrupy hallmark metaphor. I, I could never really get on board with that at all. And so where the conversation started changing for me was when I moved my family to Europe back in 2019. Now this is pre, uh, uh, pre the cough. And, and my goal was at that time, because I was researching a lot into the, the, the mystery schools and the occult. And one of the things that fascinated me at that time was the idea of the Renaissance and how the occult basically came out into the open in the Renaissance, but they did so themselves as, as Christianity very brilliantly. And they started coming out in the artwork and that kind of stuff. And I wanted to go look at the architecture and the artwork, you know, in person. So we spent six months going across Europe, visiting museums and castles and cathedrals and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just, you know, wowed by all this amazing, you know, poetry in stone, all this architecture. And so it was when we got back from that trip, I went to the Flat Earth International Conference in Dallas, Texas, and I'm standing there at the bar with my buddy, Rick Hummer. And Rick Hummer, for it, if anyone doesn't know, he's, he was uh, Rick, uh, no, I'm, Rob Skiba's best buddy, and they did the uh, Chicago experiment together. And, and so I'm standing there with him, and he's like, he's like, dude, you got to like, you got to like look into like all these basements with doors and windows and and that kind of stuff i'm like what are you talking about man and he's like oh there's this like mud flood thing and that was like the first time i'd ever heard of it so i go home and i start looking into it and i don't really know what to make of it all and you know my my first thought is how does this 
compute with anything biblically. Hmm. And I, I'll never forget, I was on a phone conversation with another buddy of mine who he's, he's I, I, I tell him, I said, okay, sell me, sell me on Tartaria, sell me on this. And so the back in like 2019, you know, it, it, it was just really taking off this conversation. There were, there were, you know, the cool kids had really heard about it, but you know, it, it wasn't like you weren't getting hundreds of thousands of views on this stuff back then. No. And, and, uh, and so I said, sell, sell me on Tartaria. And he's and he starts talking to me about it. And he says, "Well, it was a it was a it was a worldwide emperor of peace." And I said, I told him, I said, "That's impossible because every government is a beast government, and the only government that would be a government of shalom is the kingdom of uh, Mashiach." And as soon as I said that, I just I was like dumbfounded like i couldn't talk anymore i'm just like gasp and i could hear on his end he did too and we both had that realization like oh my goodness and from then on you know i started looking into it so uh, i personally now i've spoken to numerous other people who've all said that it was 2020 was kind of the year when it seemed like a lot of people started looking into the millennial kingdom happening mm -hmm. and i like many of them, you know, nobody else knew anybody else. It was just, they have this thought, you start praying about it, you start thinking about it. You're like, okay, I'm going to test this out, see, you know, uh, see what, what I can make of it. And I have to say, you know, when I came out, I couldn't, I didn't know anybody else out there for probably a couple of years, probably two years. I did not know another living soul that was looking into this. And it was really a little bit terrifying at first because you're staking your reputation on something that could be very idiotic and coming out there and saying, hey, guys, what do you think about, you know, we're living in the short season of Revelation 20 and the Millennial King Kingdom already happened. I was waiting for people to throw tomatoes at me, you know, or rots and fruit. And it was it was a very um, overbearing issue because it, everybody can relate to this, like any flat earthist out there who listen and, you know, somebody finds out that you believe the earth is flat. Of course, you know, the, the young kids, the new generation, they don't call it flat earth anymore. They call it something else. But. Back in 2015, 2016, we all said the earth was flat. And somebody comes up to you and they're like, Wait, well, what about satellites? You ever think about that? Have you ever seen pictures of the earth from space? Uh, well, the earth can't be flat, right? <laughs> and, and what I've learned in this, in this search for truth is that people actually believe that the truth, if something is true, it's going to, flat, it's going to fall in their lap. It's just going to fall in their lap and it's just going to be self-evident. Now, the, the amazing thing is, is that, you know, it, it's truth in plain sight, right? Like, you know, it's sea level and airplanes and all that, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's very self-evident. But hmm. um, it, if you want to search for the truth, it's something that you have to go out personally and seek for yourself. You can't depend on me. You can't depend on you. You can't depend on anybody else. It has to be that individual has to go out and say, I'm going to problem solve, Right. And, yeah. and I realized that with the millennial kingdom, nobody else was going to go out there and do it for me. I had all these questions, overwhelming amount of questions. Well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Many of which I still haven't tackled, but, um, you know, it, it, it had to be a case, you know, case by case basis. Right. So, uh, that kind of, I guess, brings us up to the present. That was, you know, a few years ago. And it's something that I've been looking a great deal at. Um, I will say, I will say, well, I guess we're still in the introduction part for everybody mm -hmm. out there that uh, I, I put a lot of research into a lot of different things, but for me, it's, it's, it's an all encompassing worldview. I I'm starting to call it the kingdom verse now, you know, it's like the multiverse, all these different things, these components that come together. Uh, so we're here to talk about the millennial kingdom today, but I put a lot of emphasis on the Mandela effect and, uh, time as a construct. In fact, I wrote a book called The Lion and the Lamb. And for me, the Mandela effect, it goes way beyond just these simple alterations. It's, it's something that I think has probably been going on for a very long time. And it speaks to the short season that we live in and that Hasatan himself, that he is actually stuck in time. The idea of him being cast out of heaven to the earth it is him going from being outside of time to inside of time. And so we're seeing him trying to manipulate this realm and, you know, maybe throw us into time loops, all the, all these different things in order to keep the short season going. Um, another big emphasis of my research is on the feminine Ruach HaKadosh, that would be the Holy Spirit, that freaks a lot of people out. Uh, but uh, it ties in beautifully with 
uh, well, the millennial kingdom and everything on the idea that wisdom is the mother of, of Israel. You have the masculine, the feminine divine and the age of Pisces all working together. Um, I put a lot of um, uh, research into serpent seed. That's the idea that Cain is the actual physical literal son of the serpents. Uh, pre-existence is another one I put a lot of focus on. People uh, love the idea of pre-existence until they get deep into the research and they, you know, they, <laughs> they'll freak out on that one. Uh, mm -hmm. Soul sleep, I mentioned that. Uh, of course, you, you know, 70 AD being a, a fulfillment of prophecy. And, uh, oh, here's another big one I put a lot of focus on recently, and we don't need to talk about this. I just want to throw it out there, that Yahuwah, now Yahuwah, many people would, that's the Paleo-Hebrew name for Yahweh or Yahuwah, or some people say Jehovah, this would be the Old Testament God, uh, that Yahuwah is literally the son of the father, the son of Allah Hayam. Uh, Yahuwah is Yahushua HaMashiach. Uh, Yahushua HaMashiach is in the flesh, Yahuwah. So, and I'm taking people through scripture and, and showing them that. And one more thing too, I just want to point out that, uh, hopefully I'm not boring you, Paul. No, no, no. Um, is... I put a I put a huge emphasis on on the Torah, the first five books of Moshe. People write books all the time on how to live like Jesus, and it's important to note that Mos Moses already wrote five books on how to walk as Yahushua Hamashiach walked. And uh, so the, the the thing about the Torah is that a, a lot of people are scared off by the Torah. They don't want to look into the Torah. They don't want to read and study it. But when you when you realize that all the prophets were just referring to it. Yahushua HaMashiach was just quoting from it all the time. And then the, the writers of the New Testament, Paul, uh, Yaakov, would that be James and Peter and so on and so forth? They were just teaching the Torah. It's When you understand the Torah, it's like, it's like the bottom of the iceberg and all the rest of the Bible is just the tip of the iceberg. And you start seeing things cross-referenced everywhere and it, it's just mind-opening. And so uh, I put a, every Friday night, I go through the Torah portions and it takes an entire year to go through the cycle. And so I just encourage everybody to come on over, make a tradition of it, uh, learn your Bible and uh, go through that. So I think that's my introduction, Paul. <laughs> Let's get well, into it. Yeah, well, you're certainly not somebody who shies away from controversial topics, that's for sure. Um, no, thanks for that. That was, that was highly detailed. And there's something you said in the middle of all that, obviously, just going straight to the Millennial Kingdom here, um, how you said this is really uh, uh, very much an all-encompassing tautological type of subject, and you call it the Kingdom Verse. I like that. I thought that was quite funny. Um, and that is that is something I have found myself uh, when I first got into this subject, um, again about a few years ago i didn't start talking about it until recently because i've kind of just been soaking it all in you know what i mean and going out there and do my own observations a lot like you did you know traveling around europe and seeing buildings and just trying to figure it all out but um i realized you know as i discussed in some of my videos um you know in the conspiracy world the conspiracy culture and I think this is something maybe we could get into later because you, I think you made a video about how fractured it all really is, you know, how you want to try and bring us all together in that respect. But I think a lot of us have been kind of looking in the wrong places for so long, thinking we're trying to expose this evil conspiracy all around us when really this millennial kingdom thing kind of makes sense of it all very quickly once you start to actually really take it on board. And it really does kind of... Um, go along with every other thing that we've been researching it kind of makes sense of a lot of things that the who what when where and why questions you know this is what this is it really this is what i've kind of found and it's I, you know i'm a little different from you i i wasn't uh, raised religious at all you know i came at this myself um, in 20 well 2012 is when i started even bothering to look into any form of christianity but it was 2014 where i would say i was saved you know and born again and actually took it seriously and gave myself over um, to Jesus and, and God and actually took it seriously and began to actually study these things. Um, so for me, it was easy to accept this type of teaching, but I myself, just even talking about it, have received a lot of backlash, which again, you attested to earlier as well. It's, it wasn't something people Im immediately take on board or want to even humor or, or consider. Um, and you know, I have you on today because people ask me a lot of questions, you know, complicated questions about history. And the main one, to, to sum it down, to, its, to, to distill that question down to its most basic form is, well, where's all the evidence then if he was here? You know, why, why has nobody written anything down? Surely somebody would have documented something. And 
after watching a lot of your work, you know, I, I, I can see and you can see that it, well, it was documented, actually. It's just the language was different. The words used to describe it was different. And I think, I think that's what I want to get in with you today, Noel, really. I'd like you to share some of your information and thoughts on. Um, so, first of all, let, let's start with the timeline. How do you think it all actually went down in terms of timings? Because most people in, in this realm start with 70 AD. They believe the Millennial Kingdom started in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. I know you have a different view on this, and I think it might be good for people to hear this. So what's your take on the actual timeline itself? Then from there, maybe we can get into the histories within that time frame. Sure. Um, and all the intricacies with different cultures across all the continents. And maybe you can tell that narrative for us because you've been swimming in this for so long. You must have created a, a decent enough, um, what should we call it? A chronology, shall we say, of sorts. So I'll leave that to you, Noel. Yeah. So, all right. So yeah, 70 AD I, is a great starting point. That was a starting point for me as well. Now, most people, I think, who uh, say that the Millennial Kingdom started with the destruction of the temple, it seems like 72 is kind of where a lot of people jump into it. And, uh, and I, 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 I wrote a whole book on that, The Glorious Appearing of Yahushua HaMashiach. I am fully on board that that generation was the fig tree generation. They saw all the things that go down. The fulfillment of prophecy was talked about all throughout the prophets and in the in the Tanakh. Um, so, okay, so addressing a few things here now. One of the what, as much as you know, I, I have written and I, I write a lot. I research a lot. I write a lot. In some ways, I feel very slow at my at my uh, output because. I have to go dig into all these books and find the stuff myself. And from the very beginning, I didn't want to be one of those guys that's just a historical revisionist. You know, you're just out there uh, just, you know, looking at pictures, making crap up, you know, saying, I think this happened, that happened, and I'm just going to use my imagination. And I really wanted to let scripture be my guide. Now, years ago, I started as I'm going through the Torah portions, as we're going through the, the Torah, we're studying it in, in the unexpected cosmology. We were taking the Hebrew Masoretic and the Greek LXX and lining them up side by side. Now, for everybody out there who doesn't know what the Hebrew Masoretic is, if you open up any Bible and you look at the Old Testament, that is the Hebrew, it comes from a document called the Hebrew Masoretic Text. And the Hebrew Masoretic Text is only a little over a thousand years old. It's not that old, according to official history. Hmm. Uh, the Greek LXX, however, is, is the Old Testament of the first century. And that was, uh, that's a thousand years older than the Hebrew Masoretic. And then, of course, you have the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then, of course, you have the, the Paleo-Hebrew, which I'm really investing in now. And we're putting out, we're trying to get the, the, the Paleo-Hebrew Bible out. But hmm. um, what we started noticing was that the Greek LXX, all right? So, again, the, the New Testament writers, when they're writing, they're actually quoting from the Greek LXX. And this, bought, this troubles a lot of people that they look at the way people are writing things in the New Testament, and they're quoting the Old Testament, and the quotes don't always line up. Well, that's because our Old Testament is younger than the New Testament. It's not that, it's not that old. And so as we're looking, at, they're actually quoting from the Greek LXX, and we're looking at the timeline, and it's way off completely off. I mean, we were perplexed at this at first. And we started noticing that, well, to sum it all up, according to the Hebrew Masoretic, uh, Yahushua HaMashiach uh, resurrected from the dead around the year 4,000 uh, uh, 4, years after, the year 4,000, 4,000 years after Adam was placed in the garden, which would place us up around the year 6,000. So you can see how that plays into a lot of the, the Zionist, you know, in times movement now. Oh, yeah. uh, the the LXX, however, was 1,500 years advanced. Yahushua HaMashiach resurrects from the dead in the year 5,500. All right. So right there, you have a huge discrepancy. Now, mm -hmm. then I started noticing as I'm looking into this more that you have, because I love extra biblical books. There are hundreds of extra biblical books. I try to read them all. I try to scour through them. I try to edit them and I put them up on my website. Big, big uh, focus of mine. And I started noticing that there are books that align with the Greek LXX, and then there are books that align with the Hebrew Masoretic. 
And uh, I'll give you an example, the book of Jasher aligns with the Hebrew Masoretic. But then you have books like uh, uh, the book of, uh, book of Adam, uh, Adam and Eve. You have books like uh, the Gospel of Nicodemus, which is one of my all-time favorites. Those all align with the Greek LXX. And they started, they, they would say something like this. They would say, Yahushua, they said, Messiah resurrected from the dead in the year 5,500. And then, uh, and then the, the kingdom will be ushered in in the year 6,000. Right. And I, I used to read this stuff and go, well, that's that that's a wrong prophecy that didn't happen because clearly the millennial kingdom didn't happen yet. So I would love a book like uh, Adam and Eve or the Gospel of Nicodemus. I'm like, what do I do with this? So all I started doing was putting the I started putting all these pieces together. And let me just state here first, because people will come at me, you know, you, you got to love the uh, the Christian book of uh uh, the scrabble words of insult that they'll pull out of the hat. And I've heard them all. And they'll come at me like, oh, you don't believe the Bible. You don't believe the Bible because you don't believe, you know, the kingdom was ushered in in 72 AD. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> well, first of all, he he clearly said, he said, I'm coming back for you to take you to where I am. He didn't say he was going to set up his kingdom there in Jerusalem on this earth. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the fact that uh, Israel is looks like a wasteland. I mean, you know, Agent Mark Twain, when he goes over in the 1800s, he's talking about how he didn't see a living soul and it was all tumbleweeds, right? It was all built up in the last 100, 150 years uh, post mud flood. And Jerusalem was just a little, you know, little uh, bizarre out in the, in the desert, basically. And that is exactly mm -hmm. what Revelation, how it ended. It said that Babylon, Jerusalem's Babylon, it said that it would be a wasteland of devils and unclean animals. And uh, it was not going to be inhabited during the kingdom. So that's a huge testimony to that right there. Uh, anyways, I, I, I started taking this timeline and saying, okay, so let's let's just say that the millennial kingdom happened as these books. And I, I in my book, The 7,000-Year Timeline Deception, I just lay out these quotes. I lay out the scriptural quotes. I lay out um, all the, the, the early church fathers' quotes, all how they talk about how within 500 years, the kingdom is going to be manifested on this earth. Now, keep in mind, everybody out there listening, that the kingdom was not only, a, it was not just a thousand years. It didn't happen for a thousand years and come to an end. The kingdom is eternal, all right? The kingdom was then with Yahushua HaMashiach on this earth. It was after his resurrection. It was when he manifested it on this earth, and it is still now, okay? The kingdom is eternal. It didn't go away. It was not destroyed. The thousand years specifically that we're looking at is a specific time on this earth when it was manifested on this in, in our side of the realm. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I laid this out and I, I, I looked and I'm going, okay, 500 to 1500. Well, that's amazing. And it actually fits like a glove because five, the five hundreds is when Rome fell, we entered the dark ages and the 1500s is when we climbed out of the dark ages. I mean, there's some real Orwellian language for you there. Oh, we yeah. entered, we entered the Renaissance and the Reformation simultaneously. The Reformation was run by Rome, uh, boots on the ground agents. It was the perfect way to destabilize the kingdom and to break it up into you know splintered into all these different denominations. It was brilliantly done. It was like. It was like Rome, you know, owns the printing press and they're like, oh, don't print the Bible. No, you know, uh, and, and at the same time, you have the Enlightenment. And that was a clear rebellion against the kingdom. Absolutely. hundred percent. And that's why I said earlier that this is when the occult is coming out and showing their true colors and they're blending with Christianity. And they're just running the show, you know, very esoterically, some interesting things happening, mm. uh, it, even in the artwork and so on and so forth. So. Uh, Paul, you had mentioned uh, earlier before we went live about the year 541. Yes. And and so I'm like, okay, so if, if it happened in the 500s, there needs to be some sort of mile marker. I need to, you know, be able to find this stuff. And the first thing I, I found that was really interesting was these appearances of the phoenixes that would happen every 500 years, in which I've, I've covered much on that. And the, so the idea is, and actually Clement in the book First Clement, which I wish that was in my Bible. I love, uh, I love First Clement. He talks about how the resurrection. He ties in the resurrection with the appearance of the phoenix, and he says, you know, and of course it happens every five hundred years. And 
so interestingly enough, I found a quote that uh, by a Roman historian that was shocked to find, everybody was shocked to find that the phoenix actually showed up in during the rule of Emperor Tiberius. Well, Emperor Tiberius, he was emperor when uh, Messiah was crucified and resurrected. Mm -hmm. And they said that that was a complete, uh, it, it happened within 250 years. It wasn't supposed to happen. It was a complete like sneak attack uh, by the phoenix. And I think that that's when he actually entered Sheol and he resurrected the dead. And that's when the phoenix came. And so I also have plenty of uh, prophecies like the, uh, the sibling oracles and others that talk about how the kingdom would be ushered in with the phoenix in the 500s and with the appearance of the phoenix. And so we have that. But what really got me was when I uh, started looking into their 536 and 536 specifically by the, the normies today, more and more people are waking up to this idea that it was what they call the worst year in recorded human history. Now, obviously, I would say Noah's flood was pretty bad for humanity, but uh, and even the, the recreation event before that, uh, there's been all these reset events, right? But uh, five, 536 was the worst year where they were finding that the sun actually disappeared for 18 months. The moon, the stars no longer shone. There was like this mysterious fog all over the earth. Um, uh, skies clouded out. It, it, we, we went into this ice age. Everything froze. Uh, crops were failing. And uh, as, as they're looking more and more, and we know this. We know this because of the tree rings all over the world. Tree rings don't lie. You can count them back. And this is you know part of forensic uh, evidence here. And... You can look back in, in the tree rings in everywhere from China and Mongolia to Siberia over to Ireland, all the way to California and down into Mexico, up in Alaska. And they all say that, that the tree rings testify to 536 being an awful, awful, awful year. Well, what was happening was is that it was the year of the fire reset. We had volcanoes blowing all over the world. There were probably dozens, there could have been dozens of volcanoes, like, like I said, up in Alaska, down in Mexico, all the way south of China, all over the world, they were blowing, right? Hmm. Well, then I, then I found, interesting enough, that 537, the following year, is the year that King Arthur is said to have died. In fact, the earliest reference we have to King Arthur uh, appears with his uh, duel with Mordred, his incestuous nephew, and and they basically, you know, kill each other there, or he's mortally wounded, whatever, and that's the end of Camelot. I thought, well, that's really interesting because I, you know, since doing that, I've been pouring through my Arthurian mysteries books. I was really into it back in college, and I've just been guzzling down Arthurian literature and seeing it with new eyes now, and seeing how, again, very Orwellian, how this was their idea. It was a huge distraction from the actual Camelot, the true Camelot, the Millennial Kingdom, but this was their, it, it was almost like their version of it came to a, a, an end, a standstill in 537. Mm. It was, you know, rudely interrupted. And then, of course, 541 is the year where there was a worldwide pandemic uh, that uh, people can read my paper or look at the, the presentation I did on that, where I pulled up a historian that talked about how the human race was almost completely eliminated in like a short six months period. Uh, there were just just people just getting pushed into the ocean, thrown off. I mean, just just dead people everywhere. But the kicker is that the people who were uh, being struck with this disease that would kill them and send them into madness and other things like that, they were reporting seeing these uh, spirits come and basically touch them and give them the disease or speak into their ear and saying they were numbered amongst the dead or whatever. And this is actually where the idea of the Grim Reaper originates. Uh, the idea that people were hearing these spirits knock on their door and they refused to go answer it. They would go jump in their bed and hide uh, because they knew that their number was up. So, you know, I'm just, I'm finding all these things that just lining up with the timeline and it just makes sense beforehand, afterwards, everything in the middle is the dark ages where we get these huge, beautiful Gothic buildings and cathedrals. And of course the very word Gothic, right? I mean, there, there's more Orwellian language for you. They're trying to make something dark and ugly that was actually quite, stunningly beautiful mm -hmm. um so in a nutshell that's that's the timeline that i'm going with and mm -hmm. let me just also let me also state that i get it that a lot of people out there they they they're not going with this timeline 
they, they think that I'm just making this up. I'm getting my calculator out. I'm being clever. No, I'm not. I'm literally going by scripture. I'm letting scripture be my guide and tell me when these events happen. And they do. They actually spell it out for you. They make it very crystal clear. It's not confusing. Um, so whenever somebody comes up with a theory in Revelation, Revelation on its own is a very confusing book. Okay. And the, the thing that I will, I'm a chapter and verse guy, but I'm not just a chapter and verse guy. I'm like, can you cross-reference that? You, you, you show me a chapter and verse. Okay. Now cross-reference that with another passage of scripture. All right. So I'll give you, I'll give some examples here. We say that there was a thousand year reign of Mashiach. All right. Well, where does that come from? Revelation 20. But can anybody cross-reference anywhere else in scripture where that's supposed to happen? Because if it's a standalone doctrine, I, I don't really know if I'm going to get behind it. If it's just one little verse that we're going to blow into this huge thing, a whole movement based on one little chapter. Uh, well, you can basically go back to the Torah. You can go back to the creation week, and then you can see Peter ta or Kepha ta talking about how, you know, as a day is a thousand years, and you can go from there, right? You can start sourcing that. Well, here's a here's another one that I would, oh, and, the, you know, so you have the seventh day, which is Shabbat, right? The day of rest. And this is why it's so important for uh, everyone to keep the Sabbath. Uh, here we are celebrating the millennial kingdom, and a lot of people who are pushing this view don't even want to keep the Sabbath, that, you know, the very thing that they're celebrating, um or advocating for um so that's very important well here's one more i'm going to just throw out there uh just to, to speaking of the millennial kingdom to oh dear i think we just lost him <laughs> let me just try and get him back guys i'm not sure what happened there um he must have accidentally hung up on us just to make sure guys we can still hear you can't you can still hear me right now can't you just let me know in the chat if you can still hear me if that's all right and I think from the looks of it, all my connections just fine. So we should be all right. Um, but I will, um, yeah, I will get him back. Bear with me. We'll give him a quick phone call and let's see what we can do. Um, It wouldn't be a live show without some technical difficulties, would it? Yeah, but other than this little hiccup while I'm just waiting for Noel to get back onto the uh, show, I think I think this is going quite well. I'm quite enjoying this conversation. Uh, like I said, guys, it's a bit of a, a different a different viewpoint on it on it all, coming from a different uh, theological standpoint. And you know, I, I think uh, I think Noel's research is thorough, which I which I enjoy. He's getting into all the uh, the extra books, the extra histories. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying it. So give me a second. Let me see if I can't just send him an, another link. Um, if Noel is listening, he can just jump on with the same link, I believe, that I sent him originally. It says there's two in this call. There he is. Uh, so let me just ring him. It says he's unavailable. I think he's jumping back in now. Just bear with me, guys. Noel, have we got you? Yeah, I'm back. I somehow <laughs> got kicked out. I have no idea what... Literally, I'm just sat here, sat on my hands in my car, and suddenly you just cut out. Um, but we're back. Um, and let's quickly uh, <laughs> remember where we were at. Um, we were talking about the Sabbath. Well, yeah. I, 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 did I mention the mark of the beast? Not yet. Okay. Well, let me th just give you one more. I, I'm trying to make a, I want to make a point about how I, it's so weird how it got cut out there. Um, how I, uh, how I go about my research and why I come to the conclusions I do. And so I think it's important to cross reference everything. All right. So, one of the most um, wild theories out there on the internet within the truth of Rome is the mark of the beast. All mm -hmm. right. So you, 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 there are probably a thousand theories out there on what the mark of the beast is. You go out there on YouTube, everyone has these videos. It's always like the next thing. It's always, you know, some new technology that's about to come out and don't, don't take part in that technology or else, you know, uh, you're going to get the mark of the beast. Well, I would challenge everybody. I'm like, well, instead of just, and this is why we get all these crazy theories on it because 
there's no cross-referencing happening. There's just mm -hmm. this single verse, this passage that people just use their imagination. Well, um, I would I would encourage anybody, well, try to cross-reference, find somewhere else in scripture where it talks about the mark of the beast. Well, there is something that's pretty close to that. It comes from Exodus 20 or 21, and it's the mark of Yahweh or the mark of Yah. And what is the mark of Yah? It is something that if you have the mark of Yah, you it is actually uh, obeying the Sabbath. And if you have the mark of Yah, you can't buy or sell on that day. Well, that's really interesting because the mark of the beast, you can't buy or sell unless you take the mark of the beast. And so mm -hmm. you now have these two polar opposites. You have the mark of the Yah where you don't buy or sell. And then you have the mark of the beast where you can buy or sell. And you're like, hmm, well, that's interesting. That so. Is. Yeah, so I just want to, you know, oh, yeah, here, I'll throw out one more, um, and uh, hopefully I won't uh, ramble too much, but uh, the 144,000, 144,000. So a lot of crazy th different theories on the 144,000 out there. Well, again, I would encourage anyone, well, let's cross-reference this. So uh, I did a study on Hebrew revelation. Yes, the, the New Testament does exist in, in Hebrew, and I've done studies on this. I did studies on Hebrew John, which would be Yochanan. And then uh, Hebrew revelation, and actually in Hebrew, it's not called revelation. It's called the confidential counsels of Yahuwah or Yahuwah. Really interesting. So in there, they use the, the idea of the 144,000. It says how they're like virgins in the Greek. Well, in the, in the Hebrew, it says the word betula. Well, betula is a word for a woman and only a woman or a young woman, a, a maiden, who, ha, who is not participating in sexual intercourse. Now, the idea of a betula, we have this idea in, in the Western English language that you have your virginity and then you lose your virginity and you never get it back. Believe it or not, you can get your betula status back. You, uh, a betula is someone who has not had intercourse. Uh, the first that appears is Rivka. Her name is, of course, Rebecca in the English, who is uh, who marries Isaac or Yitzhak. She's described as a betula. She has never worshipped the pagan gods and never had intercourse. Um, but the, so when you understand the betula is only ever a woman, there is never a case where they are ever men. Never. It is so. John is writing Revelation from the perspective that he has the Torah and the Tanakh. That's his only scripture, and so he's saying they're betulas. He's telling us they're women, and people get all upset about this and be like, "No," because you know a bunch of dudes. You know, they they're I'm stealing their hope that they're going to be one of the 144,000. It's like, no, 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 no. There was a there was a a time period leading up to those 40 years, 70, where there was going to be these 140,000 betulas set aside for Mashiach, for Messiah. And they were not going to have sexual intercourse. Uh, and of course, I've done a lot of studies on that and, and shown that. But what's interesting is that I think that that's where the nun tradition in the Catholic Church actually comes from. And I think that the 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 quote unquote nuns of the uh, medieval age, the the dark ages of the millennial kingdom were actually uh, of the, they were either the 144,000 or of that tradition. And uh, in fact, the the medieval documents that I have, they actually claim to be the 144,000. So that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, so I've been rambling enough. Sorry, I got cut off everybody. I don't know how that happened. Really weird. Um, I. There we go. Sorry, sorry, my, my volume was off there. No, no, can you hear me? Just a quick question. Am I, I, I can hear you. You can hear me. I can me. hear you just fine. Yeah. Lovely, right, there we go. Yeah, it's, like I said, I, I'm not sure what happened with the sound. Um, It's it's kind of all over the place today because I was just speaking then and nothing was coming through on the microphone for some reason. I mean, I think it looks like it's coming through again now. But yeah, it, it just cut off, but then the stream stayed strong and the connection was excellent and there was no problems whatsoever on this end and everyone was still here, so... Some someone cut you off, Noel, and it was it wasn't me. I can tell you that right now. But there we go. Um, anyway, it wouldn't be a live show without some technical difficulties. It's pretty standard. Oh, uh, I, I mean, I yeah, I'm used to that. I I, <laughs> yeah. I get it on my end all the time. That's it. And well, you know, thank you for clearing up your reasoning behind why that it was in the five hundreds that this began. Um, one thing I just like to quickly clarify for me, and um, when you say the phoenix turns up, what does that mean exactly? Is that a, a real bird, a flaming bird, or are we talking about something symbolic there? Could you just clarify that for me a bit more? 
it might have been a little bit of both. Uh, the phoenix appears to be uh, a bird that it inhabits the spiritual realm. And mm. so I guess my big question is, does it, you know, how much does it manifest in the material realm? So how much of it is a, how much of it is symbolic? How much of it is real? But uh, it, it appears that the ancient historians all believed that it was a reality. And it's one of those things, you know, like, you know, like the diaries of like Marco Polo or whatever, you know, you read these books, uh, you know, Lewis and Clark, and they describe like giants and things like that. And the modern historians are like, well, they didn't really see that, you know, hmm. or, you know, this, this sailor didn't really see mermaids, whatever. None of that is real. We don't really know what to make about this. But you have some uh, very legit historians and they all talk about the the phoenix being a legitimate real creature that comes every 500 years and it, it, it's literally reborn it dies it, it's reborn this is why we see interesting enough with napoleon and uh was it alexander the the russian uh when they're apparently duking it out in 1812 whatever was going on there with that story you see the the phoenix imagery everywhere all throughout mm. you know the idea that the beast rising out of the ashes the i actually have a passage of of scripture that is supposedly comes from enoch and it talks about the same thing that the beast would be thrown in the the fire and this would be referring to the destruction of the beast before the kingdom and that afterwards it would actually uh awaken and return out of the fire like a phoenix and um i think that there's something when we're talking about the these idea of beast governments and stuff i think that the the beasts are probably not just symbolic i think there's probably real spiritual entities that are connected with them including the four horsemen of the apocalypse i think that those are probably real spiritual entities that go across the earth and a testimony to that is that you know, again, you go to YouTube and everyone's like, oh, the second horseman has just been released, you know, <laughs> and it, you could do this every decade. You could go back. to It's like, has anybody looked at World War Two? I mean, if, if you want like the, the release of the four horsemen going across the earth, there you go right there. And I think that they just cyclically just are these four spiritual entities are released and they go across the earth and they they first spread uh uh, you know, politics or, you know, false religion, uh, you know, propaganda. And then the second one is war and then, and then famine and then death, right. That, mm -hmm. you know, follow in the wake. Uh, and so the same thing with the Phoenix, it's, it appears to be tied up with, with these resets that happen cyclically really every 500 years or so yeah. that bring about the, the rise and falls of uh, governments. Well, obviously, like I said, the, the symbol of a phoenix is rife within the occult, the symbol of death and rebirth, the regeneration, the rejuvenation of the old into the new. Um, the, the, the Freemasons are obsessed with it. As well. it's, just, it's everywhere, okay? And I, I can understand how symbolically speaking, yeah, maybe maybe that's what it represented when they discussed it. But I was wondering if it was like a literal celestial event, perhaps at the same time, simultaneously. If it, was like, it must have been something visual for them to be uh, documenting it so fervently. Yeah, I mean that that appears to be. There's these uh, priest of uh, in Egypt. Was it priest of? Um, I, I can't think offhand. Here I'm at live. I can't think offhand what city they were in, but they would report seeing it, and they would they would kind of know about when when it was going to come in. They would kind of look at the calendar, look at the skies, mm -hmm. and they would report it. And that was the whole thing that it there was like a. a a sneak attack that the phoenix came in during the reign of tiberius mm -hmm. and again i find that really interesting because part of my chronology is i work out because the biggest question i probably get asked is the resurrection of the dead and it's really you know paul you talked about how you came into christianity back around 2014 2015 i'm actually in some ways very envious of people who are coming into it as an adult because perchance they were able to circumnavigate a lot of the propaganda and the indoctrination. And so a guy like me who grew up in the church has, you know, I, like I was a full blown, uh, you know, with the Zionist agenda and the seven years future revolution, I used to be a big Hal Lindsey guy. I remember the discussions back in the eighties, you know, sitting around the table and, you know, the 88 reasons why Jesus was returning in 1988. And then when that didn't happen, there was 89 reasons why he was returning in 1989. I think there was 90 reasons, in 1990 as well. Uh, but I went through all of that and it's been very, very difficult for me to, 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 shed the pounds of indoctrination and all the different ways of looking at this. So people come in and they're, you know, they have all their, 
their their Scrabble bag, you know, insult words like Noel's a he's a he's a heretic, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. He's a you know, usually they throw this out there, and of course, you know, name calling is always a one on a ten scale of arguments. You've lost the debate as soon as you go for the insults because um, you don't have a point to be made. But the the thing is with the resurrection is that I've shown a chronology that there appears to be uh, a few several. Um, resurrection events, even in even in the New Testament alone, there appears to be at least a couple of them, and um, so it's not something as simple as you know, like it's just this one time event or it hasn't happened yet. Hmm. Um, I'm still here. I... <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out what to say next. Um, okay, no, no worries. That's fine. So just, just one other thing as well, which I think maybe just, just to pick your brain a little bit here. So a lot of people tell me, well, what about the early church fathers then? You know, and this, I suppose what you're giving me here is kind of an answer to that in a way, because uh, people say, well, if it ha- if Christ came in 70 AD, then what about the early church councils and all these type of things? And the, you know, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles Creed and all these type of things. And, and, do you have anything to say to the, about about that and the early church uh, fathers and were they stand in all of this? And uh... yeah, so my my understanding of history is I think very different than a lot of people. When, when people come into this historical revisionism, hmm. uh, you know, they basically just throw out all history, say it's all fake. And you know, I toyed with that for a while. And, you know, back at you know several years ago, I was looking at Anatoly Fomenko, and it hmm. did, he had some really interesting points. Uh, I like some of the things he says. I don't really jive with it too much. Um, the the fact of the matter is, is that I brought up the tree rings, okay? And yeah. the, the fact is, is that we have geological columns. We have things like that. And people could pretend like they're not there. Um, so, but they're there. And so what happens is, is that the our controllers, our spiritual controllers, uh, is, uh, you could say even Hasatan and uh, the the prince power of the air and all the, the watchers and everyone controlling the world, they they kind of have to work with the geological columns. They have to work with the tree rings, and uh, they can look. They can point to the geological columns and they can lie about it, but that doesn't mean that they're not there, right? Even architecturally, we have geological columns, and so um, I look at I look at history and um, I, I I don't. I am okay. I put a lot of emphasis on, you know, how everything is a hoax today and the world is a stage. You know, I, I wrote a paper on how the JFK assassination never happened, that the Zapruder film is faker than the moon landing footage, uh, you know, or the Titanic never sank. That was all a hoax, too. Like, I get it that the world is a stage and, and you know, there's a psychodrama that they push on us everywhere uh, to push real magic. Um, but the way, when I look at history, uh, uh, this I'll, I'm gonna go really controversial on you, and I, I apologize for doing this. No, no, go is for it. <laughs> the the big H word, the Holocaust. Okay, um, I have a a paper that I have written on you know why the whole Holocaust narrative is a lie, and the the fact of the matter is is that people really were pushed into concentration camps. I mean, the fact that you know World War II sucked for everybody involved. I mean, you were either you're either pushed into a camp or you were running alongside a tank or you were dodging the the bombs falling. Right. I mean, it sucked. Um, you wouldn't want to be in a concentration camp. A lot of people died because of disease and other things like that, or they were bombed out by the allies or whatever. Uh, but th- there's a huge difference between um, there actually being actual showers with actual shower heads. And I look at them and I go, okay, the people in, in these camps like Auschwitz actually went and took showers. That actually really happened in history. But then the rest of the world believes that they were duped into going into these imaginary showers where they were gassed. And this lie kept being pushed all through the Holocaust and nobody knew about it. And they kept going into these showers. They kept wondering why nobody was coming out alive, but they kept going in them right and dying, right? And never mind the fact that it's a wood door with a, you know, with a glass on it. That's not exactly airtight, nor is it how you kill a bunch of people because somebody's going to push their, you know, I mean, I, I would imagine if I'm getting gas in there, I would, you know, punch my hand through the glass and get a broken bloody hand, but at least I'd save everybody, right? And nobody apparently did that. Point being is that that is where the lie happens. You have something that literally really happens. People were rounded up in concentration camps, but there was no, you know, there was no documentation. There was no master plan to wipe out a race of people. Uh, another great example of this is about 20 miles outside of Jerusalem, there's these 
high places. Now, the Bible talks about these high places. They were Canaanite areas where they would put up these erect standing stones and they would uh, sacrifice to their gods there. Uh, it could be Baal, it could be, you know, um, Ashtoreth or whatever. Uh, but they, the archaeologists who came in there and uh, dug it up about 100 years ago, they found that it was actually a crime scene. They found that these, these Canaanite high places where there were, there were babies that were killed and sacrificed. They saw like a woman, like about 12 years old, that was sawed in half. I mean, it was a terrible, gruesome scene. Well, if you go there to this day, uh, the official story in Israel is that none of that actually happened. There were no Canaanite high places that were used for uh, as sacrificial sinners for humans. And they actually have those standing stones there. Now you can go there. It's like a biking trail and people take trips there and they have a plaque about how these five, I think there were five of them, these five standing stones were uh, a sign of an allegiance between these uh, five communities. All right. So right there, you can see the truth and the lie. They're, they're, they're putting the truth in plain sight, but they're lying to you about it. Uh, so when I look at a lot of history, yeah, I think that there's a lot of truth to it. I don't say it's all fiction. I think that there is a, they're taking these documentations and, and, you know, the, you know, they're snipping out books they're you know, getting rid of things they're changing things. And the, the Benedictine monks, the Jesuits were definitely behind that, but to a degree, they have to work with, you know, the actual physical realm around us, if that makes mm -hmm. sense to anybody out there. Um, so this is where I would get into my bigger uh, millennial kingdom theory that it seems like nobody's talking about. And unfortunately, it was when the flat earth movement happened in, in 2015, when Hebrew cosmology was all the rage and the AE map, uh, it was completely missed. Uh, this idea that uh, everybody was asking these questions, is the realm larger than it truly is? And that's 100% correct. Uh, our uh, our globe Earth AE map, you know, our realm is probably like a third, maybe a half, but about a third of the greater realm. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so when you read a lot of these older books, uh, Enoch, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, countless others, I started I started seeing this trend where, well, let me just uh, quote from you here, see if I can pull this up. This actually comes from Second Esdras, if I can find it. Where is this? Hmm. Here I want to read it to you, and I can't even find it. It's so important that I read it. Um, no, it's okay. Hmm. Take your time. Yeah. There it is. Let's see. Okay, here it is. For behold, the time, this comes from 2nd Ezra 7.26. For mm -hmm. behold, the time will come when the signs which I have foretold, foretold to you will come to pass. That the city, now this city is New Jerusalem, which now is not seen, shall appear. And the land, which now is hidden, shall be disclosed. Now, I've read that. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So when New Jerusalem appears, there will be a land that it is situated on, which um, nobody, know, nobody knows where that land is. The land is disclosed. But when it comes down... For the reign of Mashiach, it will everybody will know where that land is. Now, I didn't know what to do with that passage. And I started looking at that. And then I started looking at other stuff in Enoch and other things that is talking about this hidden land. The idea was is that Eden was the furthest land in the east, the furthest you can go. Uh, people are looking to Mesopotamia, and I'm like, no, it, according to these books, it's a lot further east than that. Now, of course, I'm of the opinion that uh, the land of Mu or Lemuria. Uh, was actually the continent of Eden, and that that was completely destroyed in the flood. However, uh, you look at these books and they say, okay, you go the furthest east you can go, and then, and keep in mind, we're talking about portals of the sun, all sorts of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You go further east, and it's just ocean, 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 ocean. Then you find yourself in the north, and there's this huge chunk of land up there, massive, you know, Admiral Byrd talked about this, mm -hmm. there's this huge, massive chunk of land, and it's beyond the circuit of the sun and the moon. Like, you would have to go past the circuit of the sun and the moon, you're in total darkness, and then boom, there's all this land up there. And that's where the kingdom is, all right? So, uh, and this is, this would take me hours to unwind all of this. I wrote a whole book on this called The Hidden Wilderness, and it's, uh, you know, Interestingly enough, the Essenes uh, also believed in the hidden wilderness. They believed that that uh, the, the Greeks would call it um, 
Elysium. And the idea is, is that there is a physical place on the in our realm, in our material realm, that only spiritual creatures can go to. And only you know the, the the righteous creatures can go to, and so when people ask me all the time, they look around and they're like, "Where's no, Where's New Jerusalem, Noel?" You know, there, there's different theories on this. Some people say it doesn't come down till the end of the short season. Other people say it comes down to begin beginning of the millennial kingdom. I I could care either. I could care less either way. I shouldn't say I could care less. I mean, it doesn't matter to me either way, um, because according to the books I'm reading, like uh, Visions of Paul and others, these extra biblical books, they all say that New Jerusalem is in these, this hidden wilderness or the blessed land or the undying lands um, and that a mortal cannot get there, nor can they see it from this realm because it's covered by darkness. So uh, that that's another huge piece of the puzzle for me. And it goes on and on and on from there, from the research. I've probably done a dozen videos on this. Mm -hmm. And so for when I'm talking about the millennial kingdom, I guess I kind of agree a little bit with the, with the preterist uh, po position that it was spiritual. Mm -hmm. Because if you wanted to be in the happening place where the kingdom actually was, you would be there in the blessed land in the hidden wilderness. And by the way, I should point out to everybody, uh, if they're like, they, they think I'm just, you know, this is crazy talk now, uh, you know, look into the moon map. Because the moon map was a game changer for me. And what's incredible about our moon is recognizing that it's a, it's a composite image. It's actually like a negative image mm -hmm. uh, that was an actual snapshot of the earth on our moon. And what do you know? You can see the AE map on there. It's, it's that for me, I, I was never sold. I was never solid on the AE map. I never took a position on the actual map because every map has problems. Uh, every single, even the globe earth map, there's like probably 50 different types of globe earth maps. I mean, they're just like, there is no perfect map on this earth. And no matter what position you take, so if you're going to, you know, argue from the position of globe earth, it's like, well, pick your map, which map are you going to use, right? You, if you can only pick one map. Uh, so yes, AE map has problems, but here you see it on our moon. Perfect. You see our realm perfectly preserved, but you see the greater realm on there. You see the, the hidden wilderness. I mean, it's beautiful. Um, and so I believe that's, that was the happening place during the millennial kingdom that that was open and it's still, it is now it is the kingdom. It is happening right now on our earth. Uh, that is where Yahushua HaMashiach is. That's where the saints are. That's where New Jerusalem is. And that is the new, the, 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 the true land of promise that Abraham was looking for, as it says in Hebrews, uh, that, you know, that there was the promised land in our physical realm, but there was a spiritual counterpart uh, where paradise is. Um, and yeah, so that, okay. that's been huge for, huge, that's been huge for me. And understanding that, uh, so the idea is, is that during the kingdom, you had the representatives, the kings and priests who ruled over this earth and I, over our realm. And I think that they, you know, had their cathedrals and stuff and they were ruling. But but we need to remember that mankind, they were still sinners. It wasn't a sinless existence. And in fact, the very theme of the Bible is rebellion. It is it always, always, always ends in rebellion. It There is never a time when it does not end in rebellion unless if someone has the new covenant within their hearts, they have a circumcised heart. I don't have the new covenant within my heart. Um, I'm not living in the new covenant yet. And I could say that because the conditions of Jeremiah have not been met. Uh, I'm not, a, I'm not resurrected. Mm -hmm. that, I, I, that's, that's, that's one of the conditions you have to be resurrected. Uh, and so anyways, that being said, uh, on, in our side of the realm, there could have still been fights and wars and all sorts of things, so, sorts of things going on. I know people don't like to hear that, but the Bible is edgier than I think most people think of it. You know, it, it that's been huge in, in looking at this and realizing how truly edgy uh, biblical st stories are and how we're always trying to smooth them down into this polished image that it never really works out that way. Mm. Yeah, so the, the moon map, I'm, I'm aware of that myself, and it is fascinating because the lands depicted outside of the, the, the realms, which are supposedly ours, is enormous compared to ours as well. The, that hidden wilderness you're discussing there, this Elysium realm which um, yeah. is, is unknown to us is huge it's it's like way it's in terms of land mass it must be at least three times larger than the land mass we have as earth as we know it in terms of land um so it's fascinating to so, so you think that's where the, essentially the camp of saints is and has been and will be for eternity is that what you're trying to say that that is the the everlasting kingdom now that's where it would be well 
That's a good question because a lot of people are putting the camp of the saints in, um, you know, the, uh, the North pole mm -hmm. in, uh, Hyperborea. And that, that may be, I mean, I get it. Uh, but it, it could be like an outpost here in our realm. I mean, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wouldn't put, I wouldn't hedge my bets on that. Um, but I do think it's a possibility. Now, one thing that uh, everybody listening, if you guys are familiar with Globusters, uh, one of the, the main people that he died now, he died a couple of years ago, Bob Nodal, he popularized this idea called the coffee cup experiment in which you could take a coffee cup and you could shine a light down on it and you could actually create a light source around the edges of the coffee cup. Mm. And the reason why he would do this is showing how you could actually take the firmament and with the with the sun itself, you could actually uh, elongate the light on the outer edges. It's a really interesting idea. Mm. Well, if you're looking at the, the greater realm and the sun and the moon do not uh, – form a circuit there now they will in about fifteen thousand years we can always kind of cover that but uh theoretically but if if yahushua hamashiach is a light and new jerusalem is a light then you wouldn't need the sun and the moon over there and it would and in fact all the books i've read on it they all talk about that how there's no sun and moon over there but there's a light more brilliant than what we ever experience here in our side in in, in the shadow lands over here and it would create a crescent moon uh look on the outer edge all right with the coffee mm -hmm. cup experiment and this is what I've also pointed out esoterically with a lot of the crescent moon shapes we get. Uh, of course, Islam has it, but you see it all through the Middle Ages. Here in my own uh, state of South Carolina, the flag originally, it showed the crescent shaped moon with the, um, they added the, uh, with the words liberty. That's kind of interesting. The crescent shaped moon with liberty. Uh, they added the palm tree. I think it was in 1861 to give Mr. Lincoln the fig finger um, and uh, the federal government. But uh, so one of the things I've postulated is that what if, if that's the kingdom over there, that's the light, that's the crescent shaped moon, then uh, are we the outer darkness? Are mm -hmm. we the ones that were cast into the outer darkness? And I think that there's a, um, it makes a lot of sense to me. Hmm. No, that's, that's an interesting take on it. I mean, so we, I suppose you touched on it a little bit there. So from this perspective then, so you know, um, the millennial uh, kingdom on earth begins the resurrected, the first people take part in the first resurrection, um, I suppose, rule with uh, Christ within this kingdom or maybe on earth in what you call the shadow realms, I suppose. Would it be, would, is that what we're saying there? There would have been kind of kings or potentates on earth on behalf of Jesus in, in a sense. Is that is that how it would have worked? Or would it have been because they were in perfected bodies, they were in the kingdom and everyone else had to make a pilgrimage there once a year? Only during the reign were they allowed to go there? How, how would it have, how, what would life have, been like during the millennial reign from this perspective then for for everybody else what would have happened exactly yeah that's a good question and that's one of the things that um i would encourage everyone to look into the the, the high sabbaths because uh, there's of course we have a menorah with seven of them they are eternal they have not gone away and yeah people who did not keep the the sabbaths the high sabbaths they were uh they were cursed uh during the the kingdom um, and well, I'll talk about the, the, that in just a second, but all right. So you mentioned the resurrection and I, I, I know a lot of people can have questions on this. And again, so when I'm pulling my information on this, I'm, I'm just sourcing a, a multitude of different books. One of my favorites is the gospel of Nicodemus, but you have other books, uh, like the gospel of Bartholomew and, and others that all tie in with this. And when Yahusha was crucified, he was taken down to Sheol, which was a bit of a Trojan horse affair because Hasatan didn't actually know who he was. He did not know that he was the son of, uh, of Allah Hayam, or, uh, or as I would say, Yahuwah. Um, and, and people always point out, point up the, uh, point out the temptation in the wilderness. They're like, well, who was he tempting? Them? Well, actually, he was trying to source information. And actually, uh, Michael Heiser taught this too, interestingly enough. And he didn't answer the questions the way Satan wanted. And he thought he was um, a bit of a lunatic. He didn't, th he thought he was afraid to die. Uh, he didn't jump off the cliff. He told him to jump to prove he was a Messiah. He didn't do it. Um, so anyways, he takes them down there and the resurrection actually happens. And 30 or 30 AD, 
the resurrection happens. Now, we have two accounts of this. One is that in Matthew, the people come out of the tombs. And the, the, the popular answer is that these guys just resurrected kind of like Lazarus in these mortal bodies and they died again. No, -uh, no. These people resurrected into immortal bodies and they did not die again. And after so many days, they got up and left. And the, the gospel of Nicodemus talks about this, how that these people, they resurrected out of the tombs and they, they come back and they were they wouldn't talk to anybody. They were forbidden to speak to people, but they could hear people praying. They could hear them praying and stuff like that. Really fascinating story. Um, but eventually they were the ones that wrote down their testimony concerning uh, what happened in Sheol and how Yahuwah comes down there and people are flee are flocking to him saying, you know, son of son of David, come and come and save us. Right. And he he resurrects them and he takes them up to paradise. And so right there, you have a resurrection of it. You have two types. One is a physical resurrection. You have some people that physically resurrect out of a tomb. And then you have other people like David and Adam and, you know, the prophets and Moshe and so on and so forth. And they are resurrected spiritually up into the heavens. So it's like, well, that's interesting. So now you don't have a cookie cutter um, um uh, resurrection. Well, then, of course, you know, the, the Paul crowd loves to come in and not your Paul, not you, Paul, but, you know, <laughs> the, the, the Apostle Paul crowd. Yeah. And they're like, they, they have to point out that the, the Kinker brothers, that passage of like how they're saying the resurrection has already happened and they need to be shut up. Oh, yeah. Well, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been I've been called, you know, you know, I've been referred to as one of the Kinker brothers. And um, and so uh, here, here's here's. So here's what happened next on the timetable. And Paul, he wasn't, he wasn't wrong. I mean, I, he, he was talking about the, the resurrection that was going to happen at the last Trump, which happened in 66 AD. All right. So this is going to need a little bit of explain because a lot of people don't know about soul sleep. And the idea is, is when you search all of Hebrew scripture is that when somebody would die, uh, second Ezra is a great source of the second Ezra chapter seven, when a person dies, they're given seven days of consciousness in which their guardian angel takes them all over the cosmos and and shows them things. And this is why the people are instructed throughout scripture to mourn only seven days, which is kind of interesting because after the seventh day, the body is put down into Sheol. But the the this is what explains a lot of people's experiences of how they um they they feel connected spiritually with the person for like a week after they die and stuff like that. I I, I personally believe that a lot of dead people probably can. Uh, hear what's being said about them at their funeral and that kind of stuff. Uh, but anyways, according, this is I'm just quoting scripture, guys, so people get upset at me. Uh, but Second Ezra talks about at the end of the seven days, um, the, the the righteous person is overjoyed because they see all that they're going to receive in the kingdom, whereas the wicked person or the un, I should say the unrighteous person, because there's actually three different there's wicked people, sinners and righteous. There's three different um, types of people, according to Enoch. But they're they're weeping and mourning because they see what they've missed out on. And finally, at the end of seven days, everyone is put down to sleep. You're, you're put down into sleep, into Sheol. And the way I would describe this from everything I've read, it's like if anybody can imagine uh, you're, 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 you're as tired as a dog, you worked hard all day, you go down to sleep and you have this amazing sleep. It maybe it felt like a couple hours, but you wake up refreshed. You had some great dreams, and then maybe another person uh, they they're having a terrible night of street, you know sleep, and they're like they're they're like grinding their teeth and they're having nightmares and they keep waking up right. And it's just so that's like the experience of Sheol for people, where it's either going to have amazing night of sleep or a, um, a terrible night of sleep. It that came to an end in 30 A.D. All, all that what it talked about in scripture when Yahushua HaMashiach went down, woke everybody up, tr you know, trumpet blast time, uh, he takes everyone up to paradise. Okay, so the question that comes my way then is if that happened then and Sheol is emptied out of the righteous. The, the prophecy is that uh, the wicked would be envious in Sheol because uh, the righteous would no longer be in Sheol. The, 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 the children of the Ruach HaKadosh would be taken away. Well, we see that really obscure passage in Revelation where it talks about the souls under the altar. And they're, they're all crying out, like, get us out of here. And they're told to remain a little bit longer. And people are like scratching their heads, like, what's going on with that? Well, you notice they're not in Sheol anymore. They're actually under an altar. Uh, people say it's an altar in heaven. I think it's probably both, as above, so below. They were physically, literally under the temple in Jerusalem. And we know this with Josephus, where he writes that in 66 AD at, at Pentecost of all uh, um, 
holy Sabbath days, uh, they were, uh, their voices cried out. It's like the voices of these Elohim, these gods cried out, release us. And they were, you know, taken up just as it said in Revelation, really interesting. Um, so I believe that in that 40 years, everybody who's dying, starting with Stephen and then going on forward, all the martyrs, all the people that died that didn't make it to the end of the 40 years, they're in that holding cell. They're taken there in Revelation. They're given, uh, they're given the, the I'm just going to call them sheets, but uh, the robes and, you know, just hold to wait a little bit longer. And so again, at the, that's another reset. Boom. 66, uh, 66 AD, according to the official calendar, uh, they're released and they're resurrected. And then we're waiting on yet another resurrection would happen in the 500s. And so we see these, even with the resurrection, we see these reset events that happen. And, um, you know, it's, it, I guess it's anyone's guess at this point uh, when we die, whether we go straight to uh, paradise or the hidden wilderness, um, mm -hmm. or whether we go into another holding cell and wait for the next big, uh, big event. Uh, but hopefully, because I get asked that question a lot. And so I'm just formulating this stuff off of what I'm actually reading in scripture and these different passages that, you know, that talk about it. Mm hmm well, that's all we can do, really, because a lot of, like I said, a lot of this has been hidden from us. And I mean, in the long time span of things, when you actually think about it, we've only been really thinking about these concepts for a very short amount of time. Because, like I said, the predominant thought process is that we're still waiting for all this to happen. Um. So yeah, Matt, I appreciate I appreciate your speculations on that. That's very interesting. Uh, so let's get on to. It's happened now. The kingdom's established. It's done. We're living through it. How would that have looked for the normal everyday person who wasn't a resurrected saint, let's say? What what would it have been like to live through the millennial kingdom specifically? Would you have any thoughts on that? And again, you said it wouldn't have been a time of peace. It wasn't just as clear cut as as people like to imagine it to be that, you know, it, it was just a, a perfect time to be alive for everybody. From what I'm gathering and what history tells us, that's that's probably not true. There's probably a lot of a lot of things going on, and I'll let you expound yeah. upon that if you can. Well, I would stress a sinner is a sinner, right? That that's the that's the whole story of the Bible, where Yahuwah he puts Adam and Eve in paradise, they rebel. You know, he um he he takes people out of Egypt, he he takes them to this holy mountain, he gives them he he goes through a wedding ceremony with them where he speaks the vows and he says, Will you vow to this as well? And they say, We will. And then he hands them the Torah, the, the the conditions of his covenant, and people immediately rebel. And then you go through all of Israeli history and people are just rebelling and rebelling and rebelling, and the Torah is done away with. We won't do this anymore. We're sick of this. And when they're in Babylon, Ezekiel sends them a letter and he says, he says, if you guys would just accept the terms of the condition and come back and repent. And just so everyone listening, because people are like people, are, there's a there's a saying out there that uh, you can't keep the Torah. So well, why try? Why? Why try to even aspire? Just don't do it. Just go out there, commit adultery, fornication, murder, kick a pregnant woman, eat pork, whatever. It doesn't matter. Right. Uh, don't keep the Sabbath. Don't try. But it's like, no, no, no. What he says in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 40, 41. He says, if you just repent of your transgression, just repent and be sorrowful for what you've done. I will do this, this, and this for you. And they never did. And he, so he didn't follow through with it. He never built Ezekiel's temple as a result. And so it's the same thing with the kingdom. When you have this idea of he is physically ruling over this realm. And, and uh, what I've read, what I have found in like uh, the uh, sibling oracles and others, it talks about when his government comes on the earth, there's a huge rebellion. People on this earth, they survive the fire reset, all these things, and they're like, nope, I don't want this. I do not want the terms of your covenant, of your renewed covenant. I don't want this. I don't want to be obedient to you. Um, and that you have uh, at the very end, too, another huge rebellion where he, I, I showed passages in Odes of Solomon, which I believe were written by the Millennial Kingdom Saints. I think that's the best documentation we have. It was actually written. Uh, for the layman in very simple terms for the mortals. And it's just the whole theme of it is like, it's, if it's written, it, the people who wrote it identify themselves as being in Sheol and resurrecting with Messiah. They have resurrected from the dead. They're now on the earth. It's crazy. When you read Odes of Solomon, that's actually what it says. And 
they're just pleading with people. They're like, yes, yeah, look, look, we're not sinners. We, we are resurrected. We have the renewed covenant within us. You know, it's written on our hearts. But just we're just pleading with you, just repent and be obedient. Just just please stop persecuting us. Um, I, I believe that the, the Millennial Kingdom saints were ultimately persecuted. Uh, people hated them. And I think that they they basically, they persecuted the kings to the point where Yahushua HaMashiach is like, okay, let's get up and let's leave. Let's just get up and go. And they they came for a time. They left. The kingdom is still forever. It still exists. It exists within us. Uh, but it exists elsewhere on this realm. Uh, okay, I, I will give this piece of evidence, a, a phenomenal piece of evidence for the, for the kingdom happening. Um, it's the Sabbath day. So years ago, I came upon this knowledge that every single major language on the earth, for the seventh day, the word embedded in there is Sabbath. Now, keep in mind, modern English is a kind of a, now you're from you're from uh, the UK, and of course the even modern English is not anything like uh, middle you know English you know or Welsh or something like that. It almost reads like you read those old documents. It feels like a foreign language. Oh, yeah. um, but regardless, you look at all the major uh, not religions uh, languages all over the world. They, they say it's Sabbath for the seventh day, and I used to go like, how in the world is that possible? How is that possible that every single government on this world is celebrating the Sabbath? Because they clearly don't. It's nowhere in our history books. And somebody explained it to me. They're like, well, when Israel was divorced from the land, uh, they were kicked out of the lands. Uh, of course, you know, the, the, the 10 tribes were divorced. Uh, they basically went into all the world and they, they got the governments of the world to keep the Sabbath. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense because they were removed from the land for not keeping the Sabbath. So how in the world do you get this? Well, here you have actual evidence that all the different countries all over the world were keeping the Sabbath day, and it's embedded in their very language. I think that that is some amazing, phenomenal, game-changing evidence uh, I wish more people were talking about. They kept you know, the Saturday, seventh-day Sabbath all throughout, even though our history books say something different. Um, so... Yeah, in a nutshell, I think that that's kind of what it was like. I think um, one thing I tell people a lot now is I get a lot of people coming to me weary and like, I, I'm sick of this world. I just want it to end. I wish I'd just die, you know, and and this is so hard. And I'm like, really? Because I love this. I love the world I live in. Uh, I love discovering truth and living a life for Yahuwah. And I tell people all the time that if you do not want to live for in, in the service of your, we'll say God, okay, in the service of the most high, the king of this earth, if you don't want to live in service for him, why do you think you're going to make it in eternity? What, why? What, like, how is it going to be any different in eternity? Why are you going to enjoy serving him then? Because you think it's going to be any different? Like, there could be whole new worlds of rebellions and evil things happening and we will be sent in as messengers and guides to people there and have to you know go through some terrible stuff but we have to love our service to the king or else we're not going to make it uh and so i think it was probably very similar in the millennial kingdom where you have these uh, these delegates these kings and priests and they were coming to the earth they were bringing the leaves of healing uh from new jerusalem which the 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 mortals the sinners can't go to the tree of life they're bringing them, and we see all the the architecture everywhere with the healing frequency, you know, the healing abilities um, in it. And I, I think that that was the whole point is they're trying to bring health uh, and guidance to humanity. And um, yeah, again, the 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 story of the Bible is that mankind always ends rebellion. Um, so yeah, that's as much as I can say how what life was like. I think it was, you know, and um, it would have been an incredible. I actually think that the best analogy I can come up with is the Lord of the Rings. I did a whole paper on this. I think you've probably seen them. And I talked about how uh, within Tolkien's mythology, it's really interesting because he has uh, a flat realm and Middle Earth is a flat realm. And then the the creator, he gets so upset that he... Am I cut out again? No, no, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Right. Your, your screen got black. I'm like, oh no, I got cut out again. Um, so Tolkien basically Middle Earth, he has a, a flat Earth realm, but then at the destruction of uh, is it Numeria, whatever Numenor, Numenor, uh, which is like the Atlantis of Middle Earth, 
the whole world becomes a globe, which is really lame on an exoteric level, but it's brilliant on an esoteric level because it, he says that you basically, for the elves to get to the undying lands, you can't get there on a globe earth map. You have to take the high, you know, the straight road, the elven road. And so they're they're able to get to the head and wilderness to the undying lands and that's where the kingdom is right but in in tolkien's mythology these elves who are uh, some of them are resurrected um and they're they're actually beings that you the the mortals look at them and they look like kind of normal people but if you could pierce the spiritual realm you would see them these luminous glorious beings and there's actually examples of that in lord of the rings in the book at least not so much in the movie uh, and and so a lot of the artwork, like if there are resurrected saints in uh, artwork that has survived, then they're going to look like normal people uh, be, to the mortal eyes. But, you know, if you could pierce it, so they're like simultaneously inhabiting Jer New Jerusalem and the, the hidden wilderness and living in this realm at the same time. It's pretty uh, trippy stuff. But I think um, Tolkien was spot on. And if you you know pay attention, right, like humanity, they they want Sauron to rule and they, they hate the elves. Everyone hates the elves. And so the point where the elves, they just keep shrinking into these little tiny communities and they're just surrounded by darkness. And finally, they're like, OK, I'm going to get up and leave. And they all just get up and leave. Mm -hmm. And they go back, to, they go to the undying lands where they, you know, still exist, according to Tolkien lore. Uh, and it's the same thing. It's it's the perfect example of what I see happening uh, at the end of the Millennial Kingdom. I think I remember, actually, now you mentioned that, I think what, maybe it was Gary Wayne who was making a point of this, how he was talking about the, um, the Nephilim. I think he was making references to perhaps those elves are being something akin to more like the Nephilim based on like the Twath of the Nom uh, mythology. Obviously, you're giving a different spin on here, which is, which is, Obviously, I'm, I'm all for alternative ideas, but he did bring up that at the end of the book, the elves do get on a boat, basically, and just leave. And that was like yeah. the, the end of magic, basically. <laughs> and then what was left was a human world, you know, essentially, yeah. something like there's, that. Uh, there's, there's two, uh, there's like, okay, and I, I um, to that point, there's like, okay, well, Okay, <laughs> I won't say that. But um, I the old me from five years ago, the old me from five years ago, uh, looked around at at the world. If you look at my old writings, I'll be like, "That's pagan. That's pagan. That's pagan. That's a cult." And I had no appreciation at the time for controlled opposition. All right, now I'll give you an example of this. Um, I have some friends who. Uh, they have had their minds blown over the last couple of years because when they found out that I was a flat earthist, it's just, just a flat earthist. I mean, that barely covers what I am, but, uh, they, they were so upset and angry at me. They went out to prove me wrong and they went out to prove me wrong. And every test they attempted, they failed and found out that the earth was flat and they're just, their mind is blown. And I've been watching over the last couple of years go wow, Noel, you were right about all these things. And they're just excited learning about the greater realm. You know, they're all into the Mandela effect and all these different things now. And, you know, they, they know all about the Federal Reserve and, you know, you name it, how evil Rome is. Well, the problem is, is they, they grew up Roman Catholic. And they will tell you growing up Roman Catholic, they never once ever opened up a Bible and read it. Like never in their life, they never opened up a Bible and read it. But they were diehard Roman Catholics. And that, that, that sounds very cliche but it's you know the way i guess it is for a lot of people so for them they now look at the pope and they are like oh the bible is is, is all a manipulation tool it's evil and i'm trying to tell them okay wait a second you thought i was wrong about the flat earth you see that i'm right now now give me a chance on this and let's talk about controlled opposition right you, you have the, the people running the world I, I don't know if, if the person running the, the world is a pimply faced uh, kid in Pasadena in a bagel shop at the laptop. I don't really know. But let's say let's just say for uh, billboard purposes that uh, it's the Jesuits and the Pope is running the world. Well, it would only make sense then that he would take the Bible and hug it to his bosom. Right. This is controlled opposition. And so. Now we're looking at, you know, the occult and all the things that they're holding close you know, they're taking these different mysteries of heaven that were brought down by the watchers or maybe came down from Seth or whatever. And they're, 
you know, basically all try to mon monopolize this. And so we look at it and go, well, that's pagan. That's a cult. That's new age. And it's like, well, wait a second. What, wait, what? <laughs> it, it's controlled opposition, right? Hmm. Um, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm at on. A, I guess that's my response to that, that there's, there's a lot of things that I've looked back and go, well, that's evil or whatever. Um, and this is, it's taken me a life, a lifetime to really appreciate uh, the book of Enoch and what the watchers did. And uh, Yahuwah says to them when he judges the watchers, the watchers bring down the mysteries of heaven. Mm. Now they do terrible things as well. I mean, you know, they create the giants by killing the husbands, taking the women by force and, you know, you know, doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but he says to them, he says, you brought down the mysteries of heaven. And he says, they were worthless mysteries. And I'm like, that, I've pondered long and hard on that because it's like, well, wait a second. These are literally the mysteries of heaven they brought down, like real treasures of heaven. I'll give you an example. Azazel taught mankind to use a sword. Okay, well, we see a sword in Genesis 3 when the angel comes down, the cherubim comes down to guard paradise with a sword. So we know that the weapons of heaven were swords that Azazel then brought down this mystery and introduced it to humanity. So a sword in itself is not evil, but they were used for evil purposes. And the reason why they were worthless mysteries was because uh, the watchers did not teach mankind the Torah of Yahuwah. They did not teach them to live righteously. They taught them to live wickedly. They taught them to live lawlessly. And this is what we see in Psalm 82, where there's the divine council brought forward, uh, the Elohim, and, and Yahuwah talks to them. And he says, uh, you know, like, I'm going to judge you like men because you're, you know, th these Elohim, these gods are literally ruling over the earth. They're, the, the earth is divided up by the council of the 70. I believe they've all been judged now. Um, uh, they were they were judged at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. Uh, some of them might have repented and been righteous. I don't really know. I'm not going to judge the, the whole, you know, the group as a whole. I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but but um, he's like, I'm going to judge you like men because you are not instructing them according to as you ought. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of went off on that rant there. Um, hopefully that <laughs> helps people understand my worldview that um, you have all these different religious, you know, the, the Freemasons is a great example. They're very esoteric and they hold a lot and they claim, I invented this. We created this. If you're, this is purely Masonic. And it's like, no, you're actually the inheritors. You inherited this and you are controlling it and claiming it to be yours. But that doesn't make it evil um, mm. in itself. So well, let's uh, let's get on to that aspect then. So we're... I suppose there, in terms of inheritance, were you talking about the aftermath of the millennial reign? So, um, who who did pick up the pieces and take it all for themselves? Because I assume are you on the? Are you, we maybe you can clarify for me, but I don't I don't assume anything actually. But are you on the uh, the thought that maybe all these buildings that we see, which are incredible architectural functional designs, which possibly had some kind of etheric used to them in some way are they a product of when jesus came and reigned for the thousand years do you, do you think that or do you have another opinion on that and then from there can we roll into so when jesus ended his reign in like an official sense obviously he never ends but when he ended it officially and gave it over to the little season who were the these inheritors that you're talking about so it's kind of a twofold question there all right so um okay so I am of the mindset that the Gothic cathedrals and the Gothic buildings, the Gothic nunneries, the Gothic uh, friaries, monasteries, whatever you want to call them, uh, Gothic temples, all the Gothic architecture all over the world was millennial kingdom architecture. It was built by the, the set apart saints. And there are multiple prophecies about uh, in Enoch and other places about how they would build these grand structures and that after afterwards that the watchers would be released and trample over them now uh, a great example of the trampling that happens so let's say my timeline ends around the 1500 ish and the 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 king of england at that time is uh, king henry the seventh of course you probably know your english history much better than i do we're not taught it out here in america uh, then you have king henry the eighth that followed it, it really uh it, it really struck me how King Henry VII actually uh, creates the House of the Tudors, uh, if I'm 
getting my history correct, and uh, that he actually rose, resurrected the, the the red dragon, the which is now the flag of Wales, uh, which was of course a prophecy of Merlin that the white dragon would defeat the red dragon for a time, and those would be the Anglo Saxons, and that uh, the red dragon would return, it, represented by Arthur's Camelot realm, which is now the red dragon's in control. This is the red dragon of Revelation. Hmm. Uh, so the uh, interesting enough of the King Henry the Eighth. <clears throat> I was shocked, shocked to read. I'm just like, you know, minding my own business reading. And I read how he destroyed 800 Gothic cathedrals and buildings in like a few short years in England, not in other countries. He is going around and destroying 800 of them. One of the famous ones is uh, Glastonbury. This was the one that was uh, the cathedral probably where uh, Joseph of Arimathea uh, maybe personally ruled from. Uh, this is, you know, where Avalon is, correct? So um, the, the destruction of these cathedrals, start, we talked about the World Fairs. This has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Probably since the very beginning, they went and started changing them around, redesigning them, destroying them. And for the next few hundred years, uh, so that was the first reset, right? The end of the kingdom as we know it. And then we go into the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment, they're building all new structures based off the same tech. And you can see the Enlightenment buildings are very different than the Gothic buildings. So it's it's almost like they're using the same ability, the same technology. They're wanting the same uh, blessings uh, of the kingdom, except they're choosing the curse. They're choosing to be uh, to rebel against the kingdom. And then again, we're, we're seeing there are probably multiple reset events. But the other big one would be like the mud flood event, right? We. I, mm. I, I don't even know where the common consensus is on when the mud flood happened. I mean, I've seen people say 1850. I've seen people say the late 1700s. I just ran it off to about 1812. Um, just gets a kind of a nice, neat package. But uh, whether it was a series of events, you know, or just one big event or what happened. Um, but that would be another big reset event. It seems like after that event is when they they basically changed the script again from whatever, whatever was happening in the Enlightenment. And they went into this like new world order agenda and, um, you know, and then they started destroying them all over again. A lot of those, I think that, I think the Tartarian um, architecture, I don't believe most are Tartarian architecture is millennial kingdom architecture. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably uh, post millennial kingdom rebellion architecture. And uh, people don't like to hear this, but I, I can't find a single a uh, single positive reference to uh, Tartaria, Tartarus, Tartar. Uh, in I, I have many different references in many books of the Bible, extra biblical books, and they all refer to uh, you know the the deepest realm uh, where the, <laughs> you don't want to go there. And so for me, I sometimes wonder if this whole uh, Tartaria thing is actually. I'm going to turn a lot of people off here, but I'm just speculating, and I can't help but wonder if, if the whole Tartaria thing this uh, is actually the short season uh, phase one, and and now we're in phase I don't know two, three, four at this point. I don't really know, um, but yeah, hopefully that kind of made sense uh, chronologically the way uh, I'm thinking about it. No, it's an interesting. I've never considered that. Uh, you know, a lot of these buildings were made immediately after the millennial reign by people who still had access to the knowledge and the technology to build such things which they learned thanks to the millennial reign which they don't want to obviously acknowledge as useful to them in any way shape or form it's kind of like they want all the benefits without any of the responsibility it's kind of what i'm imagining as um, yeah so think of it like this a gothic literature is unique unlike anything else it is it is unbelievably beautiful um uh, architecture and and then when you get into the renaissance with a lot of the famous tartarian architecture you get the domes you get the corinthian pillars you get um uh it's just a very it's a very greek a, a roman greek look to it like mm -hmm. a, a roman greek revival and so there was there now i'm open to the possibility that there was something else going on where you had different factions or something different types of um architecture simultaneously going on but this is what i talked about earlier is that the fact of the matter is is we have geological columns i know a lot of people don't like to hear that but we have it, it's I, i'm not saying that what our history books say is accurate obviously 
And because, you know, it's written by Jesuits and the Illuminati and Benedictine monks and other people. But I am of the opinion that the, I didn't start out this way, but I, I've come around now to this idea that the, it, it makes more sense to me that there is the more classical tr Tartarian architecture was post-millennial and that they again flipped the script in the 1800s and they started destroying that and, you know, changing history again. Mm-hmm. So like again, multiple resets quite close to each other is what you're trying to say. So wh where do you stand on the mud flood angle? Because it's um again, it's something I've I've heard a lot about. Um, obviously I've I've been there following the whole Tartarian narrative since it began, you know, and that was kind of what clued me onto considering the Millennial Kingdom angle at, at the end of it all. Um, what do you think would have caused such an event if that went and when exactly would that have happened? I mean, what do you, what's your take on all of that? That's that's a good question. I can't answer it. Was it a uh, it was a lot of energy that happened, right? So yeah. interesting thing about earthquakes is that uh, earthquakes are specifically associated with spiritual and angelic um, activity. And we're seeing, uh, I would say volcanoes too, and we're seeing volcanoes just blowing all over the earth. We're seeing earthquakes everywhere, just going off the charts. And so anyone who wants to do a, and I've done studies on this, anyone who wants to do a studies on earthquakes in the Bible. And when earthquakes happen, you have uh, people coming, you have spiritual creatures coming down from the heavens, going up to the heavens or coming up from Sheol or vice versa. And, and so um, I would think that a, assuming that the mud flood was not a series of, it could have been still a series of events, but assuming it was a worldwide event that happened in pockets all over the world, uh, it could have been a huge spiritual battle for the earth that was taking place between the Prince Power of the Air and entities. Uh, it could have been a resurrection event. We could have been, we could be looking at the return of the watchers from within the earth coming up. And of course, I had said earlier that the uh, the the 70 Elohim are ha, appear to have been judged by this point. And either they made the cut or they didn't. I don't really know. I'm going to leave that up to the ultimate judge. I'm not going to just throw them all under the bus. Um, you know, whether they ruled over humanity as they were uh, supposed to. Uh, but now we have what appears to be the 200 watchers have returned. And of course, we see this with the United Nations and different things like that. Uh, the about the 200, uh, what is it called? Crypto something. I can't remember. Crypto craters. I can't remember what they're called. Now we call them meteor craters, but, um, you know, all over the earth. And it, those might've been, you know, the holding cells, right. For the watchers. So, mm. um, that it could have been something like that, just something about a, a spiritual, some sort of spiritual activity that happened, uh, that was probably a judgment event that caused this sort of liquefaction of the ground that would create a mud flood where mm. you would, you know, overtake these cities to the point where it was easy for them just to build up instead of dig out. Hmm. I mean, people, people, and I myself have speculated. No, I have no absolute. I'm not 100 percent on this. I don't think we're given much information to 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 clarify any particular time. But it does say at the end of the millennial reign, the rest of the dead will live again. Now we don't know if that means resurrected immediately after, or if it's at the end of time before the Great White Throne judgments. But it happens sometime after the millennial rain is what we know could that have been an event something similar to that do you do you hold much weight into the orphan train theories that go around within tartarian groups what do you make of all that well yeah I, I yeah i've i've commented on that as well i think there was a video i put out a couple of years now where i talked about that and uh so yeah we, we we obviously have some the 1800s i mean if i could time travel at any time in history i might jump to the 1800s first i i i would love to go and look with my own eyes out in like Nevada territory and Arizona and, you know, places like that and see, you know, is San Francisco there, right? Just ask those kind of questions. Mm. Uh, what was the, what, what was it like to go to the Chicago world fair? And, you know, I want to go and touch the buildings and, and see if they're, you know, just plaster or, you know, what they are. Um, but um, yeah. So regarding the, orf we, I know we've been passing this all around. And so, you know, is, is, I guess, is the question of the hour, is reincarnation a thing? Now, um, well, I, I would say resurrection. I'm not going for infinite soul cycles based on your karma type of angle. I don't, I'm not set on that myself. Right. Um, but I do believe right. res resurrection is a thing personally, but I, I want to hear your take on all of this. Cause again, I, I'm not 100% and, and I'm, I'm sure you're not either, but let's, let's see what well, you've got. Yeah. Let's see what you've got. Yeah. Let's... 
yeah, and see, th this is, I guess, still my thought process through this. So uh, I would tell everybody that um, I actually do believe that the typical Protestant position is that uh, that a, a Protestant, a traditional Protestant Christian would say that regarding the status of a man's soul is that a wherever a tree falls, it, it sits there. Right. So whenever you die, whatever the status of your soul is, that's what you are for an eternity. You're either saved or damned for an eternity. The thing is, is that when you get into the pre-existence arguments and you start seeing all the scripture verses on how uh, we were all created on the first day, all souls, all souls were created on the first day. And that we'd be actually at what Yahusha says in the books of the Nazarene. He says that uh, that we are actually we became bastard sons. The, the the sons of God that you see like in Job and stuff, I believe that was us. I don't believe those are typical angels. I believe that we were all the sons of Allah Hayyam up in heaven and that we did something that caused, you know, we rebelled. And that all the literature I've looked at has made me come to the conclusion that we rebelled. And our, there is something true to the caste system in that how we live our lives, you know, whether we're rich or poor, whatever, the things we're given, it all depends on what we can handle and what we did in a former life. Uh, so I would say that our redemption process is over multiple lives. And I could say that because I believe that we did something in a former life that caused us to have to come down to this earth and redeem or uh, be redeemed, uh, either choose the uh, the atonement of uh, Mashiach or not, uh, but uh, um, and live accordingly. Um, but so there, right there, you have two life cycles, right? Beforehand, where we're at now, and then what happens next, right? And so, yeah, so that's a question I have. Are the people that are living on this earth now in this short season, it's, it's really interesting because you see this population boom starting around 1800, really the late 1700s, but it, it just it just skyrockets to just whatever billions of people are on the earth now. I, I don't trust those numbers, but uh, this huge amount of people that are born on this earth in a very short time out of seemingly nowhere and yeah, so I, I speculate, what if uh, everybody on this earth, you and me and everybody else, that we are here in the, uh, call it the outer darkness, if you'd like, um, and we are working out our redemption and we're given one more shot at this. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we did something to deserve being here now. That So I don't know if that's where you're going with that, um, but that is something that I can't say with full assurance because I like to base my theories on what I can actually find in actual scripture. Mm -hmm. um, Again, but, I, um, I'm, I'm not angling for anything because I, I don't know. I mean, an, another theory I've heard and is that we're just simply the descendants of those who lived through the millennial reign. And that's where the insane asylums come into it. Um, most people who lived through it, once the controllers took over, they locked everybody up who was still on Jesus's side. Basically, um, accused them of religious fervor and insanity and locked them all up. And then that left all the orphans everywhere because all the parents were locked up because they still, you know, stood stood for the kingdom, if you understand. Um, I've heard that theory too. So it's nothing to do with a resurrection well, yeah. or anything. So there's plenty of ways we can go at it. And I'm, I'm just speculating. I just want to hear what your musings were on that particular topic. That's all. Well, right. So the, the, the idea is that we are the children of the rebels. Uh, this is a very biblical idea. It's called the diaspora. Um, so um, a lot of people don't realize because people call me all the time, like Noel's a he's a he's a Jew, he's a Judaizer. And they don't realize that actually uh, Judaism is a, of course, a non-biblical religion. But it comes the, the Jewish people. Uh, of course, we could talk about modern Jews, whether they're the historical Yahudim, and I don't believe they are. But uh, the actual Yahudim is one tribe of the twelve, right? So you actually have the the children of Yashorel. There were ten tribes, like you had uh, Natali, Reuben, Dan, uh, you know. Uh, Manesha, Ephraim, you can go down the list. And they were all divorced from the land. They were all, Yahuwah gave them an actual bill of divorce. He says, I am done with you. You're divorced. And the idea of being divorced from the land is you can never return to the land ever again. It's done. And um, and so the, the descendants of Yasharel, these are the people that uh, Jude, James, Peter, Paul are writing to in the diaspora. They're actually writing to the lost tribes of Israel who had become the Goyim, the Gentiles, and they're trying to graft them back in. Now they can't come back to the land. And of course, uh, the Yahudim are divorced from the land in Revelation. They're done um, from the land. And this is why we don't see the land inhabited. I do think that there was, you see a couple there, you see like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you see the 
um, the Church of the Nativity or the Basilica of the Nativity. And those appear to be Millennial Kingdom structures that were uh, that would have been used for pilgrims to actually go there to those very holy sites, but you don't see the actual land inhabited. Um, and so it, it's the same thing for people today that we are, uh, the idea is if we are grafted in, to, uh, be, you know, the heritage, the spiritual heritage of Abraham through Isaac, uh, grafted into Israel, that we are in the diaspora. We are not living in the land. The land is the, what I call the hidden wilderness, right? The greater realm. I'm not there. You're not there. Uh, so yes, we would all, in, in that sense, we are all descendants of the rebels. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think that there's a very real possibility of a resurrection event happening in the 1800s. Of course, Dorothea Dix, you know, and she, she uh, I guess, started a lot of those insane asylums. And interestingly enough, you know, she ran the, the Civil War uh, hospitals. And as more and more of us are coming to learn that the Civil War was one big probably Masonic ceremony, um, like the only war, it, 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 it's very strange in America um, where you actually had that entire generation rehearsed that war for the rest of their lives. And they would go back and play battle until their dying days. Like Joshua Chamberlain, who was at Fredericksburg and Gettysburg, like 30, 40 years later, he's still going back to Gettysburg and rehearsing. It's so weird. Um, but you have to wonder if like a lot of the people who were losing limbs and, you know, things like that. And I don't know, having accidents and bad things happen to them. You have to wonder if maybe they weren't, you know, they had loose lips. They weren't going with the agenda. And of course, the insane asylums, right? They were putting all of a sudden there were all these insane people that, yeah, that needed to go into the asylums. And um, uh, yeah, they they uh, needed a, a, a taste of their medicine, I guess, right? They needed a, a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. Mm. Yes, it's all it's all great speculation. I mean, we're coming, we're coming. We're, we're, are you willing to go for a bit longer? Because we're at, almost at the two hour mark. Because there's a couple of other topics I'd like to quickly just get into to round this off. Um, or do you need to I can, go in? Oh, I can. Uh, I have successfully locked down the upper floor of my house. Nobody's <laughs> come up here for the last two hours, and I'm I'm good to go um, a while longer. Okay, so um. Look, I'm not a date setter personally. I've never been one to set dates, and I never have been even before understanding this Millennial Kingdom angle because I've always felt it's quite snake oily for all these uh, tribulation uh, end of days people to constantly be setting dates for when um, Jesus is about to return, for example. I've always found it quite tacky and something was off about it, and um, I'm not trying to do that with this angle either, the Millennial Kingdom angle. But I, I am curious to hear your thoughts and speculations on just how how long a little season is exactly, you know, and I understand it's a bit of a how long's a piece of string question. Um, but you mentioned something earlier about the 500 year cycles. Would a little season from your angle then be in the next 500 years after the 1500 reset, whenever that was, you know, when the, um, the dark ages ended, um, did you, is that where you would set? That's just my theory on where you would stand from what you said, but do you have any thoughts on that idea? Yeah, that's a that's a really excellent question, um, and I am just as you are. I am very, very, very much against date setting. I think that the, the biggest killer of this entire idea will be the date setters. I keep telling people stop date setting, and they're like, "Oh, I get it." And then they go out there and they date set. I'm like, "Ah, oh, you just date set. You just said that yeah. Jesus is coming for us in 2032. You just said that, you know." Yeah. And um, that's it's like yeah it, it I I just went through that with like the the Revelation 12 sign that happened in 2017 here we are coming up on the the next solar mm. uh, eclipse in 2024 we're a couple months away I think it is and and the tribulation was supposed to happen it was supposed to go down and now those same date setters are going to 2032 and other places right anyways um and I grew and as I mentioned earlier in the show I grew up with that uh, all the date setting all the times it was supposed to happen uh, but uh, I think it's an excellent question I think that there's good there's 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 a good reason to think that uh, we're coming up on another one of those 500 year events. Uh, it could have been, you know, a 250 year event in there as well, um, coming up on, of course, 1776. But um, we're coming up on a big event. Of course, we have Agenda 2030. We know that the elite are really gearing up for something and they're building bunkers. And it's like, uh, it's it's what's, you know, the singularity events. And for everyone who's looked into Project Looking Glass, uh, I think that that's totally legit. I think that there is a, a, a looking glass. I think that the uh, the different governments, Rome and all the others through history have them, all of our controllers, and they were able to manipulate time to their advantage, but they always knew that there was a singularity event uh, that was approaching. So I do think we're uh, coming up on another singularity event. I don't know what's going to happen on the other end. However, let me just say this. 
when you look at the the idea of the ancient uh, we need to get off the Gregorian calendar if we're going to talk about this, because mm -hmm. when you look at the ancients, the Hebrews in the Bible, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, you know, pick whatever, whoever you want, they were going off of a, a lunar system where you had the spring equinox would start the year. So we're coming up on the start of the year here very soon in a couple of months. Uh, we don't you know, go according to January. Um, and the year goes from the, the, the planting season up until the harvest. And so you're coming around from the spring feast, you go through Pentecost, and then you go to the fall feast, which would be Yom Teruah, uh, Yom Kippur, and then Sukkot. And that ends the year. It, it's, it's kind of over at that time. And so you have this lag of several months between, you know, like what we would call October, September, October time, up until March or April. And it's just like the dark of the year. It's kind of a strange way to think about it. Uh, and then the, the your cycles, again, it's, it's, it's cyclical, right? It's not linear. It just keeps going in circles and circles and circles. And this is one of the reasons why Christmas trees are so um, popular, because they go back to Nimrod, of course. But the idea of an evergreen tree doesn't lose its leaves in the wintertime. And it, it's so when you have the winter solstice, where the sun uh, goes to the lowest point on the horizon and resurrects again, uh, you have the the evergreen tree that people bring in their homes to celebrate like this uh, kind of resurrection or eternity through the the death cycle, right? Um, mm -hmm. But just letting anyone to know, I, I'm very anti Christmas trees. If you didn't get that, I'm not I'm not celebrating Christmas trees. Um, but anyways, yeah. So I my point is is that if we have gone through the year, right, and the year has come to an end, uh, we are now in the the dead season of the year. We're in the winter. And how long is this winter going to start before the eighth great day kicks into gear again? And I've I've heard a lot of different theories on this, many good ones. Uh, that's all I can really say on that is we're just so everybody knows when you have if we believe that that Yahweh uh, works on his high holy days. I love I love hearing Christians talk about this and then refusing to keep them, uh, even though Yahweh works on them. But uh, on the menorah you have the seven lights. And the last one, the eighth great day, has yet to be fulfilled. So we've seen the fulfillment of all of them, but the eighth great day. The eighth great day is, you know, why is each child circumcised on the eighth day? Because it represents the circumcision of his heart, his resurrection on the eighth day, right? The final fulfillment of all things. It's when New Jerusalem is finally revealed. And uh, we have a, you know, it's when uh, the eighth day is when uh, you have all sicknesses, uh, you know, like people healed of, of being cleansed of leprosy or whatever. The earth needs, you know, the 7,000 years to reach fulfillment, these kind of things. So I think we're still waiting on that. We're waiting on the, the kickstart of the eighth great day. Uh, whether we're in it now or not, I don't really know. Uh, I, hopefully I wasn't confusing the people, but that's how I look at it. I, I can't set a date because I'm planning, just so everybody knows, I'm planning to go the rest of my life. I am 43 years old. I'm planning to, uh, y'all willing, see my children grow up and maybe see my grandchildren. Uh, I'm going to work for the rest of my life. I'm going to die. And I am not expecting all of this. There, there might be a huge reset of it, right? The great reset. I have no clue what's coming on the other end. It might just be another one of the many resets they've had over the last few hundred years. Just an, the next big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have I have no clue what's happening. So, or yeah. you know what what's happening next. Well, you said it yourself. People did document these five hundred year resets events with the Phoenix, and they certainly lived through it to document it. You know, um, so we don't we can't dictate or judge how that's going to go down exactly. But we do know, obviously. Um, it's kind of the the new heaven the new earth uh, principle does come after the final little season has ended um and again who can say how that exactly is going to happen or manifest or go down we, we couldn't um but I, i'm 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 like you i'm i'm planning to live a full life here i'm not going to live as if um it's it's just happening next week you know <laughs> which is what a lot of people do you know they they are I, i've said it for years you know i've been in this i've been in this game for years and i've watched people live in perpetual cyclical fear every year at the new date that's been set and we cannot live like that i just i just cannot agree with it you know and and i do see the potential for this to go that way which is i don't want to be a part of that if that's going to go down but i, pre I appreciate your answer there There's, you gave a lot a lot to think about a lot of speculation um so again we, we don't know the date i suppose we don't know how long this is going to go do we um but it, it is interesting because this is the issue we don't really know when it began I mean, people keep saying 250 years to me because a thousand years is a, you know, and if you divide it by four as though it's seasons, then one season is 250 years. I've heard that. Like, I think that's why you say people are speculating 2034 or something like that or 20, um, 
2036, is it? Yeah, a lot of people are speculating based off of 1776 as yeah. well, uh, which yeah. maybe that they say is the the birth of uh, or the rebirth of Satan. Mm. Um, and you know, it, it was I have to give it to you, Brits. It was actually because you know America is still under the crown. A, a lot of people don't realize, of course, uh, Britain is under Rome, but. Uh, it was one of the greatest hustles, uh, even just going by official history books. It was one of the greatest hustles in history where the British were leaving like, bye, you defeated us. Bye. And, <laughs> mm. and you know, and the peasants are celebrating and all the while they're still under the crown. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean, a lot of really interesting things happened in 1776. Yeah. And um, uh, so again, it's, it's speculation, right? absolutely i mean you also have to wonder about the statue of liberty literally looking like a representation of lucifer from that painting with a chain unbroken on its ankle as well <laughs> and there's, there's there's a lot of strange iconography out there which does seem to indicate that 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 particular time um was a big deal especially in terms of sim symbolic you know in, in plain sight stuff we we're talking about you know um the statue of liberty you know freedom or li liberty from what exactly the british is that really what it was all about independence day you know because uh, I was I was actually born on the fourth of July, so this is something I've been thinking about quite a lot as as a British person. It's it's from a different type of angle, you know, um, and to, to think that that date was the day, you know, that land freed themselves from the millennial reign rather than British rule is quite an interesting concept, isn't it? When you start well, thinking about it. Uh, well, on that point, uh, you you might know this if, if, about my research is that I. I put a lot of emphasis on Britain being in our side of the realm because there's the outer, the, the hidden wilderness. But in our side of the realm, I put a lot of emphasis on Britain potentially being ground zero uh, for the Millennial Kingdom. And it's kind of interesting with the lights went off and they went back on, right? The, the British Empire, the, the sun never set on the British Empire. They had an mm. influence everywhere. And you see the just the the even in France, too. I mean, just the beautiful, beautiful buildings there. Britain was the first. Um, country uh, or people group to actually convert to christianity by all historical records i think that they were really blessed as a people um and um we can you know i can get more into that but the, the very word british means I, I think that you've done a little work on the uh the the, the saxons as well uh because i've talked about the saxons being the sons of isaac or the sons of yitschak uh, and the, the the evil Saxons that came in and overtook Britain, uh, but the very word British means men of the covenant, and so that that changes that can even change a lot of the thinking when you're talking about you know in America where like the British are coming, the British are, you know the men of the covenant are coming, you know these guys need, we need our liberty from these guys, we need the great divorce from them. So mm -hmm. there's um you know in, even even the, the the history of the Church of England and you know. It's it's gone, you know, a completely different direction now from what it was. But, um, you know, there, there's something to be something to be seen there. Yeah, you've you've done a lot of amazing work on that. Um, and again, I think there's way too much for us to go in. I don't want to do it a disservice. I think maybe I can get you on another time to discuss all of that. To be honest, about British history and and, and the whole Saxon invade, all of that stuff. Um, because I did watch your work on that. But it was just it was one of those videos where you know it's just packed with so much information. You just don't know where to begin. Um, and I would I would love for you to come on and actually discuss that sometime. I think maybe maybe just to just to round uh, this conversation off, we we touched on this before we spoke, but there is a, a common question I do get, um, and it's it's a legitimate question, you know, because uh, obviously we're talking about the Millennial Kingdom. A lot of people do tend to say this is all very white people orientated, and that's kind of the response I actually get. Literally those type of words, you know. And they always ask, what about the indigenous peoples of America? What about their histories? What about, you know, the Chinese history and all these people? Do they, do they just not exist in the millennial reign that we're talking about? Implying that we're just evil, white, colonial racists who aren't thinking about other cultures when we think about these things. Um, but I, I, I want to ask you, do you have any any response to those type of questions? Are there evidences for these cultures during this reign? What, what's your take on it all exactly? Yeah, there's a... Um... Uh, a great book out there that I actually did a reading through and um, it's called uh, He Walked the Americas. And the research in this book, it, it talks about how uh, Yahushua HaMashiach, or if you want to go by the Latin Jesus, uh, I feel uncomfortable saying Jesus because it's only 500 years old and created by the Jesuits, but uh, Mashiach, uh, it, it's just this incredible research of 
Mashiach walking through North America, through South America, and um, what's interesting, and going and converting all the people and making a people out of them. And you can see so many of the, even the, the Native American and uh, local traditions uh, deriving from this. Now, what, what really uh, kind of was kind of a fall out of my chair moment is when it starts out that he's called the white prophet. And now the white prophet is probably because he re it's referred to the fact that he wore white uh, linen. But I want to remind everybody that a the Spaniards, the conquistadors, uh, I, I would think you know, maybe I don't know. In, in Britain, do you do you refer to Spanish people as white people? Just just a question. Um, do you know? It's a good question, huh? It's because... a strange one. No, we would probably just call them Mediterranean. In, in a okay. sense, or uh, I, don't, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a tough one. That I, I no. would say we consider them something more Mediterranean. If the northern Sp Spanish, though, I guess in, in a way it's just European. I suppose we don't really consider them. Okay. Yeah, it's well, strange. From where? Never thought it was, that it, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, <laughs> well, because the Native Americans refer to the white people coming over, and so when I read this book, people are like, "He wasn't white. He was like," and I'm like, "Okay, yeah, fine. He was oh, what, that very dark almond skin, but." To the, to the Native American, to the Ritzkin people, he was a white person uh, coming over. But anyways, they refer to the white prophet, some really uh, fascinating things. Uh, for example, like uh, the, the hurricane, the very word hurricane apparently comes from one of his names where he was able to calm the storms. And so they named hurricanes after him. I mean, that, that was a big trip. But uh, he arrived with an entire entourage. He arrived, I think, with three ships or something like that. He, a whole entourage of mystery people. And so this was his uh, his posse. This is, I think, during the Millennial Kingdom, he came with his posse and he came over here. And uh, they, I think they had great times. And he also was in Japan and China and all through there, Mongolia, uh, the, the regions we would call Tartaria now. And uh, so I think that the problem is, is that it with the conquistadors coming over, with the Jesuits coming over, they were quickly, we know that they were destroying their books, their literature, uh, just rewriting their history and to the point that the Native Americans only had whatever left was left of their oral history to go by. I mean, as far as my knowledge goes, the, the different Native American tribes do not have like some sort of central library where their sacred books are kept. Right. Um, so anyways, I would recommend that book. He walked the Americas to people, give it a read. And so you start to see this bigger picture that the entire world was affected by it. But it was what happened when the short when the short season began or when the millennial kingdom came to an end, the conquistors came over, they started murdering and killing people, according to the official history, right? Uh, started burning down cities, destroying things, you know, rewriting history. So, uh, you know, chopping down all the big, beautiful trees in California. And it just it goes on and on and on. Hmm. So in a way, it's kind of because of the the catastrophic events. Uh, you know, coming after the millennial reign when the takeover happened I suppose during the little season um, much of it's kind of all been convoluted together that people are mixing up the conquistador and and Jesus all into like one strange destructive event when there were two separate events it's just become a convoluted complicated history now as a result is it something something like that is what we're trying to say there no I'm uh, so in, in the book he walked the Americas it's a collection uh, is it like a hundred years old now? It's a, it's a collection of all the different Native American stories, all the way down into South America through Central America, Mexico, uh, mm -hmm. like the Wahican people, and up into North America along the Mississippi and all over. How they all talk about this this white prophet who mm -hmm. came uh, and taught them about the the father spirits and taught them his laws and these kind of things. It's a it, it's a phenomenal book. And what I'm saying is that all we have left is is their oral stories of this white prophet because when the conquistadors came over, when the Spaniards came over, uh, they started coming over and just, you know, they destroying everything, mm. just, just re rewriting everything. So, uh, my, my point is, is that there is evidence mm -hmm. worldwide of this, uh, this kingdom on the earth. Right. Brilliant. All right. Well, I, I think again, we've gone for two hours, 15 minutes there. No, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground today uh, and i really appreciate you coming out to do this um it's been it's been great to actually finally get in touch with you it was uh it's been touch and go like you said for a few months to try and make this happen um and i, I 
I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, is there anything you want to say before we close this show out? I'll give you the, the final word on this. Oh, you've given me way too many words. Uh, <laughs> I probably stuck, hopefully I didn't stick my foot in my uh, mouth too much. I really enjoyed being on, Paul. Thank you, thank you for having me on. I'm glad we could do this. And I uh, hope we can continue doing this in the future. Once again, for everyone who weren't there for the beginning, my name is Noel Joshua Hadley from the Unexpected Cosmology. Uh, yeah, come on by, say hi. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, I'm a, I, I put a huge emphasis on books. So I'm a book publisher and finding very rare reads. And above all, we're a, we're a ministry and uh, wanted more than just talking about conspiracy. I love talking about conspiracy. The, the biggest emphasis is giving people permission to live a holy set apart life that you don't have to, um, you know, our, our spiritual controllers for too long have insisted that that's impossible to do, but it's not. We can actually serve our King by uh, being obedient to him. So that's the whole emphasis of my ministry. And thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, Noel. Thanks, that. So you hold on there, Noel. I want to speak to you after this show, but to everyone else listening, go check out his channel. Um, all the links in the script are in the description to this video. To all the everything, if you want to support him, it's all there. Um, like I said, it's, it's been a great conversation. We'll definitely get you back on in the future if you if you if you're willing. Um, I would appreciate that, Noel. But again, thanks for listening, everyone, and as always, God bless.